Yeah, it's Jam in here, like you drop your name tag. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got a new name tag. Okay, I'll, I'll just be like the other Jam in there. <laughs> so, um, so the this is the pass, the Wi-Fi ID, and also the password. So, is there anyone who still need the the password? Raise up your hand. Okay, then we'll move on. So. So um, at this point of time, you should know what Tech Lady is. If not, I will I will um, share more about it. So we are a community for women to uh, connect, learn, and advance as programmers. And uh, so so we do things like you know having meetups, having talks for you to share your experiences with one another. We also do the Tech Ladies Bootcamp, which is a ten week part time bootcamp where we teach you how to code by having you uh, create products for nonprofits. And eventually, we want to help you get jobs and also really have some more opportunity within the industry by, by having you talk at conferences. So, I'll just want to quickly share through like what we believe it, what what we believe in. So we believe that technology is a superpower to do good. Um, in fact, you might even argue that technology is, is not a superpower because it's really easy to pick up and it's it's doable for you to pick up. The next thing we believe is that uh, technology is for everyone. It should be accessible for anyone who wants to learn it. And it, it, it sucks that, that our industry is male dominated. So what tech ladies want to do is to create an environment where we can have more diversity in the industry. Having said that, like we are women focused. We are for women, but we are also not anti-men. So that's why you still see guys around that are helping out. So, um, you know, please don't like, why are you here? This is a tech ladies thing, you know? Just be nice and friendly, okay? So, so let's talk a bit more about the bootcamp. This is what the bootcamp is. Uh, like I said, it's a part-time program, so you don't have to quit your job. Oh. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow, I'm, I'm like really loud, anyway. So uh, we, so this this tech ladies bootcamp is a is a ten weeks part time program where we teach you how to code, and it's designed to help women with near zero backgrounds. So if you are already a very competent programmer, programmer is not for you. You can learn on your own. And if you are like completely new, it's probably not for you because it's just too intense. Uh, yeah. So. In our first batch, we had nine participants. Uh, three of them has gotten jobs, and we accept people from everywhere. So for the next boot camp, we are going to start the next boot camp in uh, 20, 24th of September, and we'll run it through 10 weeks, and we'll end at the 3rd of December. So we are only going to use the Ruby programming language. So like, pro there's a lot of different kinds of programming language, but for this boot camp, we only have Ruby programming language. And yeah, 15 participants will be selected and each of you, for the selected participants, you will work in groups of three. So you will, you will not be, uh, you will work in groups of three for one NGO on one project for the entire 10 weeks. Uh, yeah, it's $500 to participate, full scholarships are provided uh, after, upon confirmation of your enrollment. So these are the head coaches. Um, and these are the NGOs that we'll be helping this time around. If you wanna, if you wanna see about exactly what are the pain points they have, mainly they hate Excel. Uh, you wanna know more about the coaches? You can go and watch the video that we have posted on the group. So we talked about this in the info session that we held um, a few weeks back. Oh, was it last week? Yeah, last week. So. Um, this is the most important point, uh, like how do you apply to the 10 weeks program? You will need to complete a task before you can fill up an application form. So if you're, how many of you are already in the Facebook group? Okay, so you already have known that like, last night I posted a really, really long post with a lot of typos which I realized and I was really embarrassed about it. Uh, okay, so technical task. This is the technical task. Create one app, push it onto GitHub, deploy it on Heroku. So this is the task. Oh yeah, and it has to be designed, so don't give us a bare born app that's like all white. Don't, don't tell me it's invisible design, I just don't see it when it's all white. <laughs> and it has to be written in the Ruby programming language. 
So as you can see, this is like this is very vague. We just want you to create something, have something and push it on the internet. So it could be anything that you want to do. But of course, like having said that, it's very vague. You need some sort of framework. So we have some ideas for you that you can try out. The first one is a travel wish list app. So uh, like you can create an article, and in each article will have the the country name, description, travel dates, and a photo. So in the and it has to be sorted by the travel date. So if you see all the ideas, we have this stretch goal. So this stretch goal is completely optional. It's just more of like if you want to go the next step, this is something that you can do. Um, and this is also not the all the information. Like if you see the Facebook post, there's also like this select. There's a there's also like a library that we recommend you to use. So library library jam. These are about the same thing. Like some sort of tool that you can help you um, make things faster. The second idea is a personal blog. So it's just like a, a regular blog. You will have an articles and a homepage showing all the articles. So to make this more difficult. Only you can create posts on your blog. So I can't go to your blog and create a post on your blog. Get it? Okay? Okay? Yeah. And then the third thing is the events listing app. It's something like Eventbrite, where you can see a list of all the events, and if you click through it, you can see all the details of one event. And this, this if you're here for the first workshop, this is actually similar to Guess the Number, because you key in something and you get something out of it. Uh, for this time, for the magic aid, you just need to get a randomized reply. Okay, does anyone have any question about this technical task? Is it like too difficult, like completely no idea what I'm talking about, or like too easy, I can do like, I can do like Facebook or something? Ah, so in today's workshop, I think that's a nice set to this point. Woo! So, so for this workshop, if you have followed the guides, you will GitHub and Heroku are not unfamiliar words, but you will you will have heard of what is you will have heard of GitHub and heard of Heroku, but you have no idea what they do. So this workshop we will try to cover that. If not, we will do it next week. Because uh, the three bootcamp workshops that we have to teach you the skills to complete the task will eventually lead you there. So the first, the first workshop you have the Ruby programming language a little bit like, like what is what are the data types. Uh, today you'll learn how to make an app beautiful, and next week you will have like, okay how what is this real thing and how you can use that to do your app. It's, Actually, once you know once once you know Rails, it's very easy to do a blog. You just need like one line of code. It's called Rails scaffold. Head tip, like so. It's a cheat code. If you can go and Google it now, learn it. You're you're fine for a technical task. Okay. Any other questions? If you have more questions, questions, feel free to ask it in the Facebook group, and someone else will get to you. Okay. So this is the important dates. So last night we we. Um, we release the technical task, and today or tomorrow, I will I will put out the application form, so you can also see uh, the application form is just all text, um, apart from the the app. So we will start the application process either tonight or tomorrow, and we had it run it through all the way to the second of September. Uh, yeah, then you can you can read lah. Huh? Any any questions about the date? So far so good. Okay. Very encouraging, not thank you. <laughs> okay, I think that's all for me. We can start the real workshop proper. So before that, um, just a few housekeeping thing. Like if you're on the Wi-Fi network, don't download anything illegal. Uh, don't drink food. Don't drink food. Like the don't drink drinks. Don't have drinks and food inside here. We will have refreshments about like refreshment about two or three thirty, and we'll do it outside. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, that's all for the space. So, in this workshop, Hui Jing will be the lead coach and she will be standing up here teaching all of you her CSS video tree. Uh, we also have assistant coaches. So, maybe I'll just do like a, like a, just go around the room if your assistant coach is Yao, your name, Sunny. Uh, my name is Sunny. I, what else? Hey, hi, Sunny. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, okay, let's do this. So the coach will say, hi, I'm Sunny, and then we all have to say, hi, Sunny. Okay, that's Sunny, let's do it again. Okay, uh, my name is Sunny. 
Hi, Sunny. Okay, Chian. Hi, Chian. Hi, Kyung. Hi, Monica. Hi, Varun. Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Who else? Ah? Min. Hi, Min. <laughs> so, in any point of time when you don't understand what's going on or having problems with, with like whatever you're typing versus whatever is showing on the screen, raise your hand. Someone will get to you, okay? So, in any point of time, if you're confused, always raise your hand and we'll come and rescue you. Okay, now let's, we're going to pass it to Waiting. Give a round of applause. English word, English word. Queen, Queen's English, Queen's English. Turn off the English. Am I obliged to use the mic because I like really loud? No, it's fine. Um, can anybody, can everybody hear me without the mic? Because I'm, no? You want the mic? Okay, fine. And I thought I was. Hey, Antoine Yong. Yes. I thought it was very loud. Anyway, um, yeah, so as Elisha mentioned, uh, I'm Hui Jing and uh, I'm going to be the person standing in front of you for the next five, uh, four hours. So hopefully you all don't fall asleep. Um, so the first part, I think maybe the ha about half an hour, right? Um, I also want a chance for anybody who gets stuck to get assistant coaches to help them. So uh, no typing. So basically, I'm just going to be talking uh, while they some of you with problems then they can help you all set up so that's 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 my initial plan so this first part you all can like relax and hear like listen to me tell stories um so this the today's workshop is mainly about front end development ma mainly about the web um i know that there's a there's a big turnout today and not everybody will go on to do the boot camp but what I want is, uh, because personally, I love the internet. I'm like an internet fan girl. So I have a small personal agenda is that I want to tell people about what the internet really is because I feel that most people, we use the internet every day, but we don't really know like, what it is. Like, how come when I use my phone to browse Facebook, it magically appears on my phone? Most people take it for granted. And um, I just want to sort of let people peek behind the curtain to see what really goes on. So today I'll be covering a bit about the internet as well and then we'll go on to talk about uh, HTML and CSS which is basically, I believe, that is the, the foundation of the web. It's built on HTML and CSS and uh, I will go on to explain what HTML and CSS means. I think if most of you are unfamiliar with coding, you will realize that we have like so many acronyms, it's ridiculous and then we, we there was a conversation with Elisha on the group chat the other day in that we have the most ridiculous name. So in, in, the, in the programmer's world, right, Python, Pear, and Ruby do not mean a snake, a gem, and a fruit. Yeah, but um, if you... So most people actually find this like, you're talking ridiculous nonsense. Why are you talking about fruits and, and gems and animals? But if you are remotely interested and you start to uh, get used to it, then you realize it'll make a lot more sense to you. And, and people, when, when people say pear, you can discern whether they are talking about that really delicious juicy fruit or they are talking about a, a programming related thing. So first and foremost, let's talk about web development, right? What is web development? I think web is like, a very hot topic nowadays. and. Um, I think it's also because it's a reasonably, I mean the internet is a, a very, very big thing now, so it's like the most, I feel it's the most accessible uh, programming to jump into. So okay, web development, web development, but what is it? It's actually just the process of building websites. Very simple, don't, don't complicate things, okay? Don't think about all those ridiculous acronyms that we have. And it's actually very simple to get started. All you need is your computer. This, this whole image actually is not an image, it's a CSS, it's made by CSS. I'll explain what CSS later, but yeah, it's possible to do these kind of funny things if you have a lot of time like me. And you just need your brain, okay? That's all, that's all. So, 
a brief introduction, if you didn't show up for the first workshop, right, I'm just going to touch upon this. Actually, what is code, right? Code is simply just numbers, letters, and symbols. It's not this magical language that uh, only certain people can understand. It just takes some getting used to. For example, okay, basically what programming, regardless of what programming language you use, at, at, at the base of it, a text editor can read any code file. What do you mean? Like, for example, there's this language called JavaScript. If you look a bit closely at the words, right, like there's the word close, there's the word function, there's the word this. It's English, right? Yeah, so, okay, maybe it's, it's slanted towards English speakers, but it's just words, it's, it's, it's just numbers, letters, and symbols. Another language, a bit, a lower level language, like C. You can also see English words inside. There's also include, la, static, count, written. These are English words. And a, a, a very, very low language that's very close to the, basically you're already controlling what the microchips in your com computer is doing, right? It's called assembly. It's, it looks a bit weird, but actually it's just numbers, letters, and symbols, and the occasional English word. So it's, um, it's just a matter of understanding what these, these symbols do, and how we can control our machines using these symbols. That's all that it is. So as I mentioned previously, I believe HTML and CSS are the foundation of the web. So a bit, uh, what, what, what do I mean by when I say a uh, technology stack? It's basically just a, a, a combination of technologies that we need to build websites, right? So the, bas the basic thing we use for building websites is HTML because it will, if you think about it, right? The, what, when we visit a website, when we use the internet, right? We are consuming information, right? It's a, the web is an informational medium. We, we basically, we go onto the internet to, to obtain information. Like we want to see like what's the weather, that's information. We want to see what restaurant is nice. That's also information. So basically it's content, right? Content is the most important thing on the internet. So H, what HTML does is that it lets you structure and present content in the way that uh, users can consume it the best. If you imagine a chunk of text, no formatting, uh, no, like, just uh, one whole block paragraph of text. You can read it, but it's very hard to understand what's going on. But if you manage to format it, like you have, you have headers and, and you have paragraphs, it's much easier to consume. And HTML allows us to structure our content in a way that is best consumed. So on top of that, if you only have content, it, some people find it boring. So you have something called CSS which allows you to um, so-called, as what Elisha said, make it look pretty. So you can add color, you can add images, you can uh, rearrange it on the side. CSS is what allows you to do all this. And um, on, top of, on top of that, there's this thing called JavaScript, which we won't be covering today, but it allows you to add some dynamic elements to your websites. For example, let's say uh, when I click sign up, I want the sign up form to spin in a circle and disappear. Okay, JavaScript can do that for you. But even if you don't want, if you don't add that, uh, it is fine also. And um, JavaScript has become more powerful uh, in recent times, so it's, um, it actually deserves a workshop on its own. That's why we're not covering it. It's way too much. So today, we're just going to cover the first two levels. Um, so now, if you want your website to have uh, additional functionality, for example, Facebook or a lot of other websites, like all the accounts that we forced you all to sign up for yesterday requires you all to create an account. So all this information, they are like, I don't know, I'm estimating 65 of you. 65 of you entered information into those websites. So all this information has to be stored somewhere. And they're stored, so websites that require user login, for example, must have a database at the back end to store all this information. So some websites don't, like um, some personal blogs, if it's just like your own blog, you don't need any, web, any sign up, you, you don't need the database, but a database would be required depending on the purpose of your website. So sometimes, um, some sites also need a, need, 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 a, need a database. So this is actually a very basic technology step for creating a website. So basically today we're only covering this part and this part. The other parts will be covered 
in the future by other people. Make screen bigger. Eh? Make screen bigger. Make the screen bigger. Mm. Magic. Nope, wrong. Sorry. Quick. There was a full screen command. It's not control F man. Sorry my I at home I use at home you, you try full screen. I don't know. My you know doing uh full screen full screen. That's <laughs> sorry, my bad. <laughs> Important, just the just just the I, I will I will cover the content as important by reading it up. Um, okay, so today the uh, a few tools you are using is uh, GitHub, Nitrous, and Heroku. Um, again, these these terms sound very funny, so I'm gonna try and explain. So GitHub is a Git repository hosting service. I probably just confuse you all even more. Um, Git is a so is a version control system. Uh, so imagine like, in my very first job, I used to help out doing project management and then we would have like word documents for meeting minutes. But um, because I was very junior, I was like the, the junior level, so my meeting minutes had to be edited by my senior. So after my senior edited my minutes, right, she would append the words V2, then her name. And then after my senior edits it, then must send to manager ma. Then the manager will read through it, manager will edit it, and manager will change the name to V3, then manager's name. And then the manager will send it back to me and ask me to make some changes because somehow after he edits, he don't want to make the change. He wants me to make the change again. So then I have to take the file, make the changes, and then I rename it V4 and then my name. And then eventually every week's meeting minutes we, we have about like we have V final, then V final two, and V final final final. You, you know, so then you have like ten of the same copy of documents. Yeah, but for code, right? Um, so s engineers are very smart people. So some they came up with a system called uh, is a what we call version control. Is in in the sense that you don't actually have to physically keep ten copies of the files uh, uh, on your computer. What is the and this is a very simplified explanation. It's just that. Uh, after I make changes to the file, right? The moment you save, you save it and you commit it. Okay, commit is another phrase that I will explain a bit later. But once you commit this change, right? Even though there's only still that one file on your computer, the change, the previous version is actually uh, stopped. It's like a snapshot, so you don't have, have ten copies of the same file on your computer. But the history of your file changes are is still being recorded somewhere. So this system that records this history is called Git. So that's 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 a as basic an explanation that I can think of. And what GitHub is is just that um, it's a it's a online place. So like I mentioned to uh, one of the participants who came very early while trying to explain what hosting service meant is that think of the internet as like virtual real estate. So like in real life, uh, if we want to live somewhere, you know, we either have to buy a house or we rent a space, right? So when you have a website, if you own that website, that website needs to live somewhere. So hosting, what hosting, uh, what a hosting service is, is like your landlord. So you're actually renting a space on the internet for your website to live. So GitHub is actually one of those so-called landlords that will host your git repositories meaning your code they will like when and 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 because they do it for free with limitations it's like a, a very generous landlord that uh, lets you use their land for free so so that's the analogy that's the best analogy i can think of now nitrous is an online development environment because now that i look across everybody's machine is different I see a six-year-old ThinkPad, I see a lot of Macs, I see some Surface Pros. So everybody's environment is going to be different. So the coaches are thinking that um, it's going to be very hard to get all of you to set up the, the setup properly. But turns out if you use Nitrous, also got problem, but I think less problem. So it's an it's a online envir development environment. So basically how, how it works is that when, you, when we develop programs, right, um, 
there are certain prerequisites that need to be installed on the machines that you're working in in order for the code to run. Um, and to install all this software and to get the, the machine to be set up, right, actually deserves a workshop on its own because sometimes, you know, everybody's and everybody, the, the software installed on everybody's computer is slightly different. They're always Somebody will always have some problem, there will always be some error and something will always go wrong. So we chose to use an online development environment. Basically what it does is that it standardizes everybody will use the same environment and hopefully will have less complications. So if anybody still have a problem, please raise your hand and ask an assistant coach can I help you all. Lastly is Heroku. So Heroku is a bit similar to GitHub, but it actually hosts your application's code. So when I say Git, it's, it's like the system that remembers all your changes. Now Heroku, it hosts your actual code, the code that your program, use, the, your, your program is written in. So it's the same, it's another landlord. This landlord offers you space to host your website, uh, your application. So, yeah, as I said, most circumstances, we do development on a local machine, but, you know, complicated. So, that's that. Uh, so, ah, now my favorite topic, internet. So, what, 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 when you think of internet, right, I don't know how many of you have heard the word cloud, but if I tell my mother, if I, I mention the word cloud to my mother, she'll say, huh, not raining what, don't have cloud. So, as in, cloud is it's just another piece of jargon that throw around, but it refers to uh, online things that are hosted like online, but what does online really mean? Is it really like in the sky, like particles flying around? Actually, no. The internet is actually a very physical thing. So the internet is an entire network of networks that connects all the world's devices to each other. If you think about it, right, you, got, you have a phone, oh, most of us have multiple devices, right? Got phone, got laptop, maybe you have a tablet, you have, uh, some of you have smart TV, some of you have smart fridge, somebody has a smart toaster, and whatever is connected to the internet, right? as long as you're connected to the internet, technically all your devices can potentially talk to each other. It's actually very amazing if you think about it. And um, so networks, is a net internet is because it's a network of networks. Like all of you in this room, right, you're all connected to IDA Labs 4, that network, right? That is a single network. But this IDA4 network is connected to a larger network that is served by, I don't know who is the ISP, maybe it's, let's pretend it's Starhub. So Starhub's network, we are connected to Starhub's network, who is in turn connected to like the, a bigger network. So that is, that is how, let's say you have a friend in Argentina and you send them an email. Somehow the information from your computer sitting here in Singapore can traverse this network and hit Argentina half a planet away. So it's actually very physical. It's actually made up of, I mean, this is a, I don't know if you can see, but this is an undersea cable. So the world, most, the, the entire world's networks between uh, continents and countries, they run in the ocean, undersea cables, and they are fiber, fiber glass, op, uh, fiber optic cables. Actually, they're very expensive. And then they, are, they have, they, they are not just cables. So they are like intermediaries, they are like data centers and exchange centers that looks something like this. Basically, it's just racks and racks of these servers, and you'll see a lot of... Okay, actually, this yellow thing looks very big, but all these are cables. So imagine, like, if at, at home you run an Ethernet cable, just think, like, 10,000, 100,000 of those cables running through all these buildings. And, and they, they, take up a lot, they take up a lot of power, and, and they have to be cooled, and it's like, yeah, this, this sort of thing. Um, then we, we also have our cell powers. That's why we have our Star Hubs, our M1s, our Singtels, right? These are our telco networks, and they are the ones that run the so-called national level infrastructure. So, like, there's cell towers, and then there's also so-called there's like the like when we when we get fiber from Starhub, they also run the cables that are underground. Also, then it goes to then it hits your house already. So, if you have that that little thing at the corner somewhere in the bottom of your house, that one, that's what you use to connect to your telco providers network. So then you'll be, this should, should be reasonably familiar, these are like internet cables, then your device. <laughs> so this is actually the physical internet, right? So this is, a, this is a global submarine cable map. So all these cables, and Singapore is very impressive because for, for a tiny little island, right, there's quite a lot. Uh, where is Singapore? <laughs> eh, here, Singapore has about five, 
I think five very major global submarine cables on our shores. And these submarine cables, I think in Singapore there's probably still some security. But in the grand scheme of things, right, there is not very high security one, it's just lying on a beach somewhere. Of course it's supposed to be buried, but you know, waves, right, if sometimes it erodes and then these cables get exposed. So if you're a particularly malicious human being, and you get an axe, you get angry, like, I'm gonna chop this cable. Actually, you can, you can potentially disrupt the internet. The pro, the, the, but the, the, it's not, it, it won't be that bad. It's simply because the way the internet works, and I will explain a bit later, is that it's actually built for resiliency. So let's say one cable breaks, right? Um, internet will be slower for a particular region, but it will not fail altogether because the traffic, the internet traffic actually reroutes itself. But I'll explain how this works very high level later. But this is a global submarine cable map, and um, it's quite interesting. Then there's also internet exchange. So um, the data center picture that we showed, that looks something like that, there's a lot of it all over the world. We, Singapore also has. And um, it's actually unmarked. But if you Google, it's actually public information. It's just they don't advertise like, hey, internet exchange here. So like, I mean, it's, 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 um, there's a Chinese saying that don't declare that your goal is here kind of thing. So that's, they are there, they are, not, they are not hidden from view, but they are also not announced. So I actually can Google where these internet exchanges are. So there's this Big Bang data exhibition that's still ongoing at Art Science Museum. Uh, I think it will last until about October. And um, it's a very interesting exhibition. Of course, I went for it. Uh, and and it, will, it will explain more about like some history of the internet. Basically, some of the things that I, I, I talk about today will be there, and then there are like some cool exhibits. Uh, and if you're Singaporean, I think got discount, so you might as well go, right? Like, I'm not Singaporean, but I still go. So, a bit, a brief history of the internet. Huh? What's <laughs> That was not me. Okay, I will try to project my voice. Um, so the internet actually started out as a military research project because like just after World War II, you know, there, uh, there was this standoff between the Soviet Union and the United States, right? So I think what happened was that the Soviets launched a rocket like, into space. And this, 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 again, this is my interpretation of history, so it may or may not be accurate, take it with a pinch of salt. But then the Americans got a bit stressed, they're like, um, the Russians seem to be advancing, you know, in science and technology, we, this will not do. So they set up this advanced research projects agency, like APA. Basically, it was not really just for internet, it's basically to expand technology and, and science. So it, it actually encompassed a lot of things. And in the past, and in those days, Computers are not like these laptops that you can put in your bags. Computers were about the size of this room. People used to walk inside computers rather than carry them around because they were simply so huge. And computers then were, were very, you say they were very rudimentary in function in a sense that there were a lot of things that they could not do. A lot of things that we take for granted now, like for example, I wanna, I wanna pass a file, like I downloaded this really nice video clip I want to pass to my friend, I can, oh, I copy onto a, pen, uh, a pen flash drive and I pass it to you, and most of the time it just works, right? Regardless of, of the, the type of computer you're using. But in the past, right, computers couldn't talk to each other because they were very expensive to build at the time. Like one computer would take you about, I don't know, one quarter of a million dollars, and think it's 1958 value of quarter of a million dollars. Okay, it's not like current quarter of a million dollars, and because they were so ex and they were so expensive to build, and they were proprietary, meaning like if usually built by universities, right? So for example, I built this computer. I use my own uh, uh, so-called style of or language of coding, and another university. Also, look, imagine, uh, imagine like NUS, NTU, right? So the NTU guys built one computer, and the NUS guys also built another computer, but they are different teams, right? So they use their own sort of language. So there, there was no standardized protocol at the time. So let's say uh, the NTU guys came up with a very interesting program, and the, the NUS guys visited, or like, hey, this program quite nice. Um, the only way they could replicate it on their own is like try to remember what you saw and then go back and write it, rewrite it in your own 
your own uh, for your own computer. So in the grand scheme of things, right, this was very, this was not very effective. Like you had to rework, you had to redo somebody else's work, just to to to, and you you end up replicating a lot of the work. And this thing was so expensive that it really didn't make sense to to replicate it. So a bunch of uh, research scientists, they all of them agreed that we need to have a way for these computers to communicate with each other. So um, there's this concept, circuit switching and packet switching. Okay. Circuit switching is um, is the is the mostly it's like it's like traditional telephone lines, right? They use a concept called circuit switching, meaning if you can imagine those fifties movies, then there's this lady that sits behind a switchboard, then when someone dials the phone like hello operator, please connect me to Mr. Roberts, then this lady will like connect the switch. That's like so so think about it that way, it's like then the line will be kept open for the duration of the call. So it works for voice communi traditional voice communications because the, the line should be open for the duration of the call because you're having a conversation with another person. You don't want to like halfway like if you're calling your mother like, hey, help me buy some well oh, then drop off. Then can or not? Yeah, huh? Buy what? You you cannot drop you cannot drop off halfway. So the line is always kept open. But when the when we, the, when they were trying to design a computer network, they realized that computer data doesn't really have to have the line open all the time. So basically, it's not uh, because when, if the line is open, I don't know if any of you can remember what use the internet in the nineties. Cause I, I when I was a kid, we used dial up. So when people are using the internet, right, you cannot call my you, the if anyone try to call our home phone, it will be engaged because the internet was like on the line. So that in a sense, if you had a different system. Uh, that, that they wanted to have a system that, that didn't depend on the line being open all the time. So somebody came up with this concept of uh, packet switching, meaning you the data that you need to transmit, right? Instead of transmitting the entire thing, the thing in its entirety, you break it up into packets. So it's it's uh, you you can actually send it like what per packet. So for example, if if um it was if if you think about it, right? Let's say you have a really long uh, a, a really big file, and and there were two two machines they wanted to send out. If if the you have to send the whole file, right? Like then my machine send first, then you have to wait. You have to wait for the whole thing to finish before the other one can send. But if, if they're all broken up into packets, how it works is that I will send my first packet, then you send your next packet, so it can be sent at the same time. That's the that again. This is a very layman's explanation. That's probably not entirely accurate, but just imagine it that way. So packet switching was the the innovation that these scientists came up with in the 60s. So, when I mentioned that computers couldn't communicate with, with each other, the, the, the decision was made to come up with um, standardized protocols. So what is a, a protocol is basically just a set of uh, uh, rules that everyone agrees that, okay, whatever the type of programs that, that I write is a communication protocol. I agree that we were standardized to use this 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 uh this method, so that everybody has to follow the same method and and it's agreed. It's like it's like language lah, so to speak. Like if we all agree to speak English and everybody can understand English, the message gets across. If somebody chooses not to follow the protocol, like I want to speak French, then too bad lah, nobody can understand you. So think of it that way. So they came up with a a series of protocols. So one of them that is very that you will you may or may not encounter if you are the token IT guy at home is like TCP and IP. This acronym stand for Transmission Control Protocol and Internet Protocol. So when I mentioned that the data that is sent from your computer over the internet is broken up into packets, right? You 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 must the first question is that if you break it into packets, then it has to be put back together. So something needs to determine this. So the, the, the transmission control protocol handles this. It will, it will contain so-called instructions on like how to put the packets back together. Another one is the, is the internet protocol. So basically, each of these packets have to be sent to the correct recipient. You, you cannot have like, if you broke out into 20 packets, then 10 went to like 
somebody else's computer, then um, that, that, that doesn't work. So the internet protocol handles the correct recipient of these packets. Again, very, very layman's introduction. But every single device connected to the internet has an IP address. So an IP address is basically the, the most common format is a, is a series of four, um, four numbers. So like 192.168.0.1, that's an example of an IP address. Um, interesting fact, we actually ran out of IP addresses a few years ago because in the 60s when they came out with the protocol, if you think about it, right, four, four, uh, four, di four sets of numbers each with three digits because the, the numbers run from uh, 0 to 255. They thought like, should be enough, right? Turns out wasn't <laughs> enough, so actually they, there's now a newer protocol called IPv6 where the IP addresses are much longer and um, the new IPv6 addresses, there are enough of them so from a mathematical perspective, the number of permutations of these IP addresses is about the amount of grains of sand in the world so I think we probably won't run out but you never know <laughs> so this is like random fact um, okay this part, in hindsight I realize it's very complicated but basically, um, transmission of data is per layer. And I'm not going to cover this in detail because I'm going to introduce a very good book that I found that is, I think is actually available for free. Um, so we're going to skip this. Now, the internet and the worldwide, the internet and the web are different things. Internet, as I explained, is, a, is actually the physical infrastructure that, con that, that your data actually passes through. But the World Wide Web was actually invented by this man, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, British, in uh, 1989. So he was a uh, research, he was also in academia, and um, basically they wanted, you know research papers, I'm not sure how many of you uh, actually wrote like university thesis and stuff, but you know that if you write that type of paper, right, um, you have to cite your sources, right? So you have to write, according to Thomson 1997, ABCD XYZ, and then, you know, you have all these sources. So he was thinking that, you know, some of them, if they're writing more doctorate theses, their, their, their bibliography section is about as thick as the thesis itself, right? Sometimes, exaggeration. So he was thinking, uh, it would be a nice way if, like, sometimes you, some people actually want to refer to that original text that you're citing. But then, at the time, it, it, because it's all, like, analog on paper, then you actually have to go and dig through the original paper, and then flip, 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 flip then go and find so it was, he was saying, if there was a way, like if you're using computers, was a good way to be able to link directly, like I click, then I can link, jump straight to that paper, that'd be nice. So it's a, he, he, he thought of this concept called like a hyperlinking, right? So that, that was how the, the whole concept came about. It's basically for, for the easier, easier, easy to link relevant documents to each other. Because at the time, internet basically was just for like documents, for, for people to... It's just digital, digital copies of physical documents. That was the main purpose. So he created these three technologies that actually power the internet, as, the, the web as we know it today. So the hypertext transfer protocol. So when I say hypertext, it's like whatever I said just now, hyperlinks, right? So there's a protocol. So again, you have to, there, there's this set of rules that all these uh, documents follow to allow like linking to each other. So that's the, the protocol he had to come up with. Then he had to come up with the concept of a uniform resource identifier. So URL would be a bit more familiar to most people, but basically it's just like every single resource must be unique because if it's not unique, then you don't really, like is it this one or that one? So that's why most computers actually follow this. It's not just an internet thing. So like if you try to name the two photos, the same name, right? Your computer won't let you, uh, they'll say, uh, you already have a file that's this name, why don't you name it image bracket one instead? Yeah, because um, the, the uniqueness is actually very important for the computer to know exactly what you are referring to. And the third one is the hypertext markup language. So, which is HTML, which is what we will cover. And so, he came up with this for, again, for structuring the content that you're going to be, the, be sharing on the web. So this is what the web is made up of. And um, I found this particular, why I like the internet so much is that it's very different from a lot of 
it's a it, it's like a bit it's a lot it's so open as opposed to a lot of things I, I get a lot of a lot of in society there's there's a lot of um how to say selfishness in like this is mine you know I want to keep I want to keep uh, uh, things within myself but the internet is actually so it is it's a very refreshing concept in that it, it it wants to be open it wants as many people to use the internet as possible and it wants um, people to be able to access as much as possible so it, it's, a, it's a very open concept and a very very early concept that was in the so there are specifications for all the web technologies and everything one of these is be conservative in what you do and be liberal in what you accept from others. This is a bit philosophical, but this was actually uh, with reference to how you handle when data packets are sent to you. But if you think about it, this can apply to like in general, right? It's, it's sort of like leave, leave things better than when you found it. And I found this like it's a very it is a it is a very nice thing that it's very nice that the internet was built on this type of principle on top of this type of principle, like leave leave it leave leave the work leave whatever you 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 are right better than when you found it. So so yeah okay a bit philosophical but I really really like this. So okay as I mentioned if you like reading books, um, this is these are all the books that are related to the topics that I touch. Later on, I will send the links to my, my slides are online, so if you all, all the links can be clicked on, I'll, I'll, I, I will sort of like send the link to my slides to all of you later. But so, um, these are, what the, the first book is uh, Where Wizards Stay Up Late, basically it, it, it talks about the team that actually built the internet. Uh, Tubes, right, is, there's this guy, he, he went on this so-called adventure all around the world to actually go and see, like, what is the internet actually, so he went to visit like the data exchange centers, you went to like some beaches actually look at how people lay the cable. So actually that, that one's also quite interesting. The packet part, the layer thing that I thought was very complicated, this this person, uh, Charles Severance, he introduces it in a very basic way. That's very easy to understand. So it's a very short book, about hundred pages. And uh, the last one is written by Tim Berners Lee himself. It's um his his take on how he came out on the internet. So he, like um if you are interested in some internet trivia and if you like to read books, if not, never mind, doesn't matter. Um, I link all these, I think it's to National Library one. So like, actually Singapore Library, very, very good. Like, I'm happy to pay income tax. Um, so one concept that I would like to introduce is the concept of clients and servers. So, cause I think if you are gonna continue or if you actually talk to the so-called IT guys in where, where you work, right, you will definitely hear the word server being thrown around. Like, oh, server is down. And uh, like, oh, server not working. Uh, maybe need to reboot the server. But what is the server? Actually, servers are just computers. This actually, when I started out, um, you know, I, I, I did not study computer science. Um, if anyone's interested, I have a finance degree. Ha, huh, I cannot tell, right? Anyway. But so, so actually, I, it took me a while to, read, to understand what, what the concept of server, but Actually, think about it. Server is just a computer. I will explain it later. Think of the internet as this black line. Uh, it's a it's a it's a representation of what the internet is. So servers are just computers that are directly connected to the internet. So it's it's just like a lot of the servers are are, are actually like the desktops you have at home only. It's, it's it's just a computer. The only thing that makes a server special is that it runs certain software that allows it to respond to requests. So. Okay, then you have your internet server provider. This is like your Starhub, your Singtel, whatever. So most of us, right, we, to access the internet, we cannot just simply plug into any hole that we see lying around. We have to usually either connect to a public Wi-Fi, and if you think about it, right, this public Wi-Fi is provided by internet provider. So it's either Singtel or M1. So, so somebody is providing this service. You cannot just directly plug to the internet. You have to go through this internet service provider. So your phone, your laptop, these are known as clients because what cli the difference between a client and a server, the clients are the ones that are making the request. Like for example, when I want to go to Facebook, right? If you type www.facebook.com, somehow Facebook appears on your computer. But I'm very sure that the files that run Facebook do not exist on your computer. So how come, why is it that, that Facebook can be, can appear in your browser, right? 
it's because you're actually making a request to the Facebook servers. So if you can recall my earlier analogy about landlords and space, right? The code that runs Facebook actually lives in a computer somewhere. In fact, they live on many computers spread everywhere. But this 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 code is that it, it is in a physical machine. And when you type your address www.facebook.com, you're making a request to, to these machines to like, hey, can you please pass me the, the Facebook code so that I can display on, on, on um, my client's browser? So your your the client, i.e. your device, is making a request and the server, so the, the, the place where the website's code is hosted, is making is responding to that request. So I'm serving you the website. So I think that's that's why they named it server because uh, we're not actually that creative with naming. So servers I think is uh, might get a bit confusing because you can refer to the physical computer as a server, but there's also some the concept of a software server. So what makes the ser the computer server special different from my normal computer is that it's running a software, it's running a server software that allows it to respond to these requests. So, so if that's a bit confusing, never mind. It took me a while to understand this also. One day you understand. So at all the intersection points, there's always a router. So what this router does is, I mentioned this concept of packets, right? Packets flying everywhere. These packets need to know where to go. So routers, so most of you, if you have internet at home, you will have a router. And so what the router does is, it's just that, it's, it's the traffic control. So like, um, when it gets, when you are making requests out, out from your home to the internet, right? You have multiple devices. Maybe your mother wants to go Facebook and see pictures, and you want to go and buy things on Taobao. This this traffic needs to go to different different websites. So the router will route route it. So the, what route? But the routers. So the internet is actually made up of every network is connected to other networks through routers. And what, what happens is that each router doesn't know the final destination, but it will know the closest neighbor that can get to the final destination. So it will, it will know to send the, forward the router to the next router, and then the, that router will send to the next, so it's like hop, 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 hop. So that's basically how the, the internet works. So as I mentioned, clients will request resources and services from servers. So when you request from Facebook, you're asking for text data, you know, like names and stuff. You're asking for photos, you're asking for videos. All these are requests and the servers will re reply with these requests. So how it works is that you'll connect to the internet, you'll, you'll connect to the server, you'll make your request like, hey, give me this web page. Then the server will send a response and then the connection terminates. But this, this, this happens like split second, it's really fast. But this is, you can break it down to these four steps. So what happens is that when you enter a URL in the address bar, right? So the URL is a, is a long string, but each part of the URL has a meaning. It consists of the protocol, the server, and the requested file. What I mean? Okay, so protocol, as I mentioned just now, HTTP or HTTPS, this is known as the protocol. It's the first part of the URL. The next part is like www.unicorn.com, right? This is the server name. So every server actually technically has a name. And um, because sometimes, this is how scammers work. Sometimes what they'll do is, let's say you want to go to a particular website, like www.unicorn.com is the official website, right? Some people can, sometimes you'll see people will spoof it and you'll become like, it might be um, www.unicorn1.com. And some people, unsuspecting people might be routed, might, might go to that website instead, even though it's just like one letter difference, it's a completely different server, completely different destination. And that, that's usually how scammers work. They will get a very, very similar name, and most people who don't notice, then they'll just, oh, go there. Or like paypal.com, it becomes P-A-Y-P-A-1.com. Uh, you also don't know, then you also go wrong place. So that's the server. So every server is unique. And then you have the name of the requested file, like rainbow.html. It could also be like rainbow.jpg. So that's the requested file. So this is what the URL is made up of. So basically the browser will send a request to the server. So you ask the server for it. The server, because the, the files are, all the files 
make that make out the website live on the server. So the server will like, okay, in my hard drive, like, okay, where is this file? Like I find the file, oh, rainbow.html, then I, I send, so I will send the I will send a copy of the file back to you. Then it will display on your website. So this is the mechanics of how how your browser gets information, how come you, how you can view websites. So everything is connected by links because the internet is built on links. So when you click on a link, you are just clicking on a pre-entered URL. So let's say there's a gallery of rainbows link that links to gallery.html. When you click on it, right, it's the exactly the same uh, mechanism. So it's slash gallery.html will just re return it and your browser will refresh and load the page. So this is just the basic of how the, the, the internet works. So the, um, I'm going to mention absolute and relative links and I think this will be relevant moving forward if you continue to, 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 to uh, explore more into coding or, or, and stuff like that is that absolute paths are very specific because they will specify the protocol and the server exactly like go here is exactly here to retrieve the file. Uh, there's another, another type of path called relative path where you don't specify the server and the browser automatically assumes that whatever resource that you're referring to is the same. So let's say I'm on facebook.com uh, or let's say the, the, the code that you're writing, you, you're writing in a HTML file, right? Okay. Um, if you don't put in this 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 uh, server name and everything, right, you'll just assume that it's at the same level. So same level as the, the files that you are in. Uh, this will make more sense when I we switch to the nitrous and the file browser, and then you can see what I mean when I say same level. So okay. So everybody managed to get this to work or not? Like on your nitrous, you will sh you should see, oh why is it so small? You, you should see, uh, you have two folders, there's a public and a views, and then there are a few files outside. The, the main focus of today's workshop is the files inside the public and the views folder. So basically the gem file, the app.rb, uh, you, you won't touch it one. So it's, it's just supposed to be there so that the app will run on it. So um, if anybody has any issues, just, 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 just ping the, the assistance. You, you will see this dot erb file um, basically it's a templating language erb is a templating language so you just assume for now uh, just pretend it's html because it actually looks exactly the same as html but of course i'm not going to cover anything ruby today so let's let's just go with that assumption for today so if we have wait let me open my
Okay, this this is the target that I hope everyone can achieve at the end of today's expand. workshop. Huh? How can I expand? Uh, how can we expand? Can you call it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Responsive design. Anyway, uh, this, this should be the end target. Uh, for now, oh my god, why so slow? For now, you should have a very plain, it's a white background, black text thing. So the, the thing about nitrous is that I'm um, just going to briefly run through This section here is the text editor And here is your file browser And the bottom part here is the terminal So this is, the, this is just the names of each of the sections You won't need to touch this add, add .ruby file don't need to touch So if you can write just the first file you open, you open index.html. You should look something like this. Um so in your terminal, right, I think most of you should it should look like this. You should see, um, guess the number, and then git, and master. Uh, if it's not, you need to navigate to that directory. Yes, please. Can, 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 can. So, when we start, right, ideally, uh, your, your terminal should have, you should have navigated to, the, to this location. Basically, it corresponds to the file, the file browser. So it's going to be code, then guess the number Sinatra, it should reflect on in your terminal. Anybody stuck? Can you zoom or not? Oh, can. Can zoom. Good. <laughs>
okay, for, for people who are generally okay, right? Can you all try and run this, this command here? Bundle exec ruby dot slash app dot rb. If if you see these four lines, you're okay. If got error, please raise your hand. We will go over and help you all. Um, the instructions are in the link that Elisha sent out.
Okay, so if most of you run that bundle exact Ruby command, right, you should see about four lines, and the last word on the line is port 3000. So what this does is that it allows you to see whatever the, the effect of your code is. So if you click on the preview button and you click on port 3000, right, it should, you should see this. This is an indication that all is well. If you do not see this, then all is not well, then raise your hand and ask for help. Okay, right, I can continue, right? Okay, okay, I, I will move on because life. Okay, let's so now I'm just gonna use I'm gonna use the code as a oh sorry. Testing. So I'm I'm gonna use the code that we have to, to run through uh if you refer to my slides later you can. Uh, I will basically whatever I in the slides I will cover verbally right now. So this index.html file is an example of how a HTML document should look like. So the first line that you will see, there's this exclamation mark dot type dot HTML. Uh, no dot. This, this, opening, this opening line basically tells your browser because your browser understands HTML files. Your browser can, can read HTML files, so to speak. It tells your browser that this document is a HTML file. That's all. So it actually stands for document type. It just declares to the browser that, hey, I'm a HTML document hall. So that's what the first line does. And every HTML file you, you create must have this declaration. If it doesn't, the browser will, the browser can potentially still open it, but it may not behave the way you expect it to. Because when the browser knows that this is a HTML document, it will process it accordingly. So it's like when you submit form to the government, right? You must submit. You, you, you cannot just your name must be correct. You cannot put your brother's name and expect the the, the correct result to occur. So you have to declare that you are a HTML document. So the browser knows how to deal with you. The next line, okay. So how HTML works is that HTML is made out of text. What do I mean by text? You will see a lot of these um, angle brackets throughout the entire document. So 
whatever is between these angle documents, right, these are known as tags. And there are a lot of different HTML tags that you can use to format your content. So, I, okay, I think still have to use the slides. Uh, na, 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 na. La, la, la. Okay, so content is marked up using tags. Tags usually, okay, now this is the part of um, web development that, that you will need to understand very early on is that some things are arbitrary. So the first arbitrary thing that you encounter is that tags usually, but not always, come in pairs. So most tags, you will have an opening tag. For example, this is a paragraph element. So it's angle bracket P, open angle bracket, close angle bracket. And you will have an ending tag. That a closing tag will have a slash, backslash, backslash P. So everything in between it, we refer to it as a HTML element. So this is like a paragraph element. But some, some tags don't need the closing tag. I'm sure there was a reason for this, but I don't know why it is. So for, for me, it's like, the more you do it, then the more you, you will remember that, oh, this one got opening tag, this one don't have. So it's like when you ask me, when I edit English sentences, and you ask me why this particular sentence is correctly, I'll just tell you because it sounds right. Um, there's, so there's a, there's a logic behind it, but uh, I'm not really sure what it is. So just, just take it, most tags come in pairs. So, the, so I mentioned that this is the basic structure of a HTML document, which should be very similar to what you all have in the project. So dot height. So there's um, HTML itself is a tag. So there's an opening and a closing. So if you refer to your own index.html, you'll see there's also opening and closing. So Basically, it just mm, demarcates or oh, this is the start of the HTML document, this is the end of the HTML document. So whatever is in between, there are two parts. There are two major sections in a HTML document. There is a head and there is a body. So um, I'm asking Weijing to type the link out for you so you can also just follow on the slides for the laptop. Where is it? Oh, you very flexible, man. Where's my... Do you need a screen here, actually? Otherwise, you can just do a mirror. Uh, yes, actually. Oh, uh, you don't like your presentation, Yeah. Uh, let, me, let me have the same screen on your screen. Ah, you want yeah? to, you want, I, I want to do two screens. Oh, okay. I've got a new refer. Is it up? Oh, of course, he's in full oh. screen mode. Wait, wait, wait. He's in full screen mode. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to take one minute. If you want the slides, if you can't see the screens, go to this website and load the slides now. Oh my god, without the one. No one. Uh, yes, yeah, without the one. <laughs> Why is the one there? Huh? I'm zoom the numbers, right? Uh. I type wrongly, then they find it. Does it work? Ah? Did I type it wrongly? Yeah, it works. It works. How do I navigate to the spot that you are on now? Uh, wait, wait, wait. wait. T1 everybody, T L L. <laughs> FYI one looks like this. Uh, 
slash four slash two slash hash slash four slash two. Okay, I'm moving on with life. Where's my cursor? Uh, to, to navigate, you can use arrow keys or you can press space bar. So, space bar. So, I mentioned the document type already. So, the HTML element. So, every HTML element. Every HTML element, uh, every tag, will have a set of attributes. Um, and they will be different depending on the type of tag you're using. So for example, the HTML tag is pretty special uh, because it's like the grandfather tag and it has an attribute called language. So we need to remember one thing about writing code in general, regardless of what language you are, you have to be very specific. For example, just now um, I was helping somebody navigate to the correct directory, right? You couldn't get there because there was an extra slash. So that's a problem. If you typo something or you accidentally add a dot or a slash, right? It probably won't work because computers are not intelligent there's no fuzzy logic not like your washing machine have to be very specific so for attributes same so even though what I noticed uh, when because I, I, I've done this course before right some people actually they type language that's all L-A-N-G means L-A-N-G I'm sorry you, you cannot be creative in this regard so but what, what this particular attribute does L -A L-A-N-G, you can declare the language. So uh, why is this useful? If, mo if you all use Chrome, I, I, I kind of feel most people use Chrome. Sometimes if you go to a foreign language website, like you go to a Russian website, right, then there's, you have this, there'll, there'll be this gray bar at the top that says, hey, this site is in Russian. Do you, wanna, do you want us to translate it? Um, how on earth does Google know that that website is in Russian? Uh, this particular feature only works if that the, the website creator actually specified oh, uh, L-A-N-G equals like whatever the code is for Russian. And um, another benefit of, of having this attribute, meaning this HTML is a very forgiving language in a sense that if you don't have this attribute, your site will still work. It's just that there are less features that are available to you. So if you don't include the language attribute, it's still valid. But you don't get the benefit of you know um, certain features that browsers can provide. So why is this good? Most of us here are, I feel all very able-bodied. But actually, there's a significant population of people who use the internet that um, have some disability. In in some way, you could be so it, it visually impaired people actually also need to use the internet, right? And they'll use something called speak, uh, screen readers. I think it's less common in Singapore, but there's still a. a a respectable number of people who actually need to rely on, on screen readers. As someone who is very, very nearsighted, I always very paranoid I mean, become blind one day, so I think this applies to me. Uh, screen readers, um, when screen readers read the websites, right, they actually rely very, very heavily on the correct HTML text to, to sort of convey the message correctly. There's a, I, I will cover this a bit later on why it's so important to use the correct HTML text because as I mentioned, right, HTML is very forgiving. Essentially, you could actually just put HTML, you could put everything in between without any text, right? From a visual perspective, your website will still render in the browser. But that post, the, the, the person who is using a screen reader will probably have a less, less pleasurable experience browsing the website. So, the that's the thing about HTML. It's, it's um, good and bad. Uh. Good as in like, it's forgiving, but bad in that you can afford to, if you don't care, right, it doesn't penalize you for not caring. So anyway, moving on. Um, so the next part, there's a head element. So whatever, actual, whatever information in this head element contains metadata about your website. Meaning, what is metadata? It's actually just uh, information about your website. This does not actually appear on your website itself, but it, it, um, it, it, it contains information about your website in the sense that uh, there's a title. So the only things that actually reflect whatever you put in the head element are two attributes, the title 
and the meta description, which you I don't think you all have that line in your code. Again, it's not crucial, but it's a very good to have. Title is especially important because the title is basically what shows up on the tabs on the top of your website. So if you if you actually want to try right, you delete you delete whatever whatever is inside the 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 between the title tab. You save it when you refresh the preview window. I think the tab won't have a title. May or may not work because I'm not sure how Nitrous renders. But why is the title important? Google or uh, like search engines, you know when you when you, you search for things on the internet, it's a, it returns a list of results, right? And whatever is listed is a is actually a page title. So if you have no page title, Google will not re Google will not find you. So this to me is the modern interpretation of the rhetorical question if a tree falls in a forest. If you have a website and Google cannot find it, does it exist? Rhetorical question. <laughs> so the site title, very important. Don't miss out this line. You can miss out the other lines, but the site title, very important. Especially if you want your site to be found. Um, so one other, uh, one other piece of important link that you want to put in your head element is links to other files. So I'm, when I talk about CSS later, this probably will make more sense. But what happens in HTML is that you can uh, re make references to other files inside your project directory. So for our simple project, we probably only have the index and the styles.css. Um, if you continue, like, but you see there are other files, there's, uh, for bigger websites, right, each page will be its own HTML, and things so, so and, and you will have like maybe multiple CSS files, you will have some JavaScript files here and there. How does the browser know that all these files are related to each other, you have to tell the browser by using a link, uh, a, a link tag. And the, there's this particular attribute. So I don't know if you can see the color from behind. The, this, this, this the, is formatted in a way that the actual tag itself is yellow. And each of the attributes is orange. So the link tag has a particular attribute called href. And it's a, it tells the browser the location of where this related file is. That's all. So whatever is inside your head element technically does not show up on the page itself, except for the page title that, that shows up as a, as, a, as a tab title. But it's still very important. Now, the body element is where you see all your work. All your content, as long as it's between two body tags, it will show up on your web page. So it's the main content of the web page, and it ideally should only be one body element on the web page. Again, the forgiving nature of HTML, if you want to put three body elements, your page pro will probably still render, but it might behave very funnily. So let's keep it, let's, let's, let's be standards compliant, only one body element. So if you have an opening body tag, you should have a closing body tag, which should already exist in your index.html. So all this content in between, so you can see, right, there are many different tags that you can use to structure your content. In this example, I have like, oh, I have a header tag. Inside my header, I can have an image for my logo. Then I can also have a, a navigation, which is actually a list of links. They have their own tags. UL actually stands for um, unordered list. Then LI is like list item. So there are many different tags you can use. There's like H1 for header one, P for paragraph, things like that. So this is the full set of tags that you potentially can use. You, you will not know all of them, because I also don't know all of them. But the, the reason why I put this very long list here is just to prove a point, a point that there are many different tags that you can potentially use to mark up your content. So for example, there is, um, you could make everything a div, but let's say you have a list of you have a, you're writing a recipe and you have a list of ingredients. You could put every, help. Yeah. You could potentially put everything between P text, paragraph text. But if it's a list, ideally you should mark it up as a list. So, so it, 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 it's, a, it's a semantic thing. It's like, it makes more sense to mark it up as a list. 
So you, you should use, there's a list element for that. And there are many other elements that you potentially can use. And each of these tags, browsers will add additional features when you mark it up. So for example, if you mark something up as a list, right, the browser automatically will add the bullet points for you. So little things like that. That's why you should try to. So if, if, if you don't know, you actually just, just Google because there are, the, again, as I mentioned, I don't, I also don't memorize this whole list, but I will Google to see that if, is there a, an, a, a more appropriate tag for the purpose that I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to use. So, okay, basic demo template, never mind. And one, one concept I want to introduce is that uh, the way web pages render, render things uh, is top to bottom, left to right. Um, I actually used to work in an advertising firm and a lot of my designers were print designers. They are meaning they are used to doing physical media. They are, they are the type that print those very nice posters you see on the bus stop, that type. But for them, right, they are very used to having a fixed, uh, a fixed camera. I mean, they can control. I want my logo to be 20 cm from the bottom. Yeah, they are very used to this control. But when they first started doing web design, and we, we try to explain to them, like, uh, no, we cannot, like, when the screen size change, it cannot just jump to the bottom, as in, doesn't work that way. Then, then I kept repeating the phrase top to bottom, left to right, so that's, that's why this is the title of the site. How the, because web pages, you think of it as every element is a, is a box, it's a rectangular box. And these boxes, the, the browser, because the code, right, if you see your file, is like, is, is, is this one, not like many lines, and the browser reads the lines, follows the lines, like each line, and it will render each element top to bottom, left to right. So, like, okay, header, then a render, the first one is a header, then a render it first. And like, essentially in this order, top to bottom, left to right. So the, 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 this is a concept, let's try to keep in mind. And there are, there, there are two, types of elements. Uh, first of which is a block level element. What I mean? Block level elements take up the width of the entire container. Container is just the your browser window. Think of it as a container. It contains your content, right? So when I say take up the entire width, you look at the dotted lines. It takes up the entire width. Even though rainbows, right? After rainbows is blank space, right? But this this space here is occupied, it belongs to to rainbows. So in this particular example, the H1, H2, they are like header tags. P is a paragraph tag, and these are list tags, right? All of them, they are, they are considered block level elements in the sense that they take up the entire space of the container. There's a long list, so if you want to click the link, you can see it. And another type of element are inline level elements. And this is actually in the official documentation. If it's not block level, it's inline. So I think they couldn't explain it either. So they just like, oh, if it's not, you're not inline, law, you know. But for inline elements, it's, it's again self-explanatory. It doesn't take up the entire container. It just, you know, its own, it takes up its own space. And it's inline. So links, links are its own tag. The links use an A tag. And they are inline elements. So this the Mansell color system, this is a link, and it, you know, obediently takes up only its own space. It doesn't, it doesn't take up the other spaces, but a block level element would like, just push everyone away and take up the whole space. So, very commonly used inline tags are, as I mentioned, the A tag, the link tag. There's a, there, there will be a tag for input, which you will encounter later. Um, IMG image is also a, a inline level tag. So another full list, big list, if you are interested. Hi. Do you want a breakfast or you want a Okay, let's break, everybody. Everybody is back and um, okay, okay, okay. I will stop talking. We do hands on because uh, you know, like, I think everybody very bored already.
So um, let's all just go to Nitrous and um, so this is the basic index.html and right now your page will look like this. So it's a bit boring. So let's okay let's let's get used to how it feels to to how 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 we generally do web development. The benefit of this setup is that what when you make a code change and you save the file, right? Um, it will reflect uh, immediately here. So what you could potentially do is you open this as a separate window, then you you like show both screens at the same time if you want. This is just an option. Um, if you want to switch, also can. I, I'm doing this because then it's easier for me to say stuff. Um, so what whatever so so basically what you can do is um just try 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 making a change so let's say i say you know the original file has guessed the number game i, I don't know what game i just want guess the number so we remove the word game and then save the file so if you are like me like to use keyboard shortcuts right uh, if you're on a Mac, I think it says Command S. If you are on a Windows, it will probably be Control S. Uh, keyboard shortcut works. If you don't want, you can use the file save interface. Also can. So once you save the file, if you notice when you make a change to a file, um, on the tab right, it will become a circle. The moment you save, it will become an X. So some you can use this as an indication, like sometimes when you refresh your page, you realize, hey, how come my change doesn't reflect? That's probably because you haven't saved the file. So if you, you double check, you make sure this is an X, that means that you have already saved your change. So once I've saved my change and I refresh the web page, and okay, so that's that's basically we will be doing this uh, quote, 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 save refresh action many times. Many times. So what we have now is let's let we, we can uh, quickly go go through. I mentioned the head element just now before the break, and um, whatever that is in the head. So you see this um, style sheet or UTF-8. This text doesn't show up on the web page at all because it's part of the website's metadata. But what does show up is whatever is between the body text. So we have a. Uh, H1 element stands for header, for guess the number. We have a paragraph that says, here's a simple game you can play to try to guess the number I'm thinking of. Then another paragraph and then a link. So, as I mentioned, this is the end result we're trying to achieve. So what we have in the, in, in the project folder that we prepared for you, we also have a folder of images. So, in order not to let everybody's website look exactly the same, I actually provided like four backgrounds. Um, yeah, okay, this one looks a bit meh, but sorry, I, I like no time to prepare nice images. So you, you can pick and choose. Uh. Uh, so too dark and too light, and then there's also a, a, there's also a trophy image. Okay, dot .svg is just another image format, but um, personally, I like this particular image format because it actually just code so I can actually make edits to it in the code itself uh, won't be covering that, it's a topic for another time but so just treat it as a standard JPEG or standard PNG file uh, basically it's going to be a trophy of a uh, picture of a trophy um, and we're going to be so we're going to be styling three separate pages there's this, the which is the uh, let's call it the, the title page of this game uh, the logic behind the game we are, we, it has already been done for us. So let's say you click on start the game, you should see this, and this page uh, corresponds to the file that's inside the views folder called play. So if you click on play, you will realize that it is actually just HTML. That's why earlier I mentioned if you see the .erb, pretend it's HTML because it looks exactly the same. So same, there's a body with a H1 that corresponds to each. So okay, the only thing that is different that you cannot control today is this funny percentage bracket thing. Okay, this is Ruby code. 
So because we are not touching Ruby today, let's let's just um, leave it. So you cannot change. Try to guess it, and uh, yeah, you, you just 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 take it that life is like that, and just leave this alone. Um, but what we can do is we can actually change the text if we wanted to. So it's just that everything between the text, we just leave it alone. And then there's also this this new tag called form tag. So basically, a form tag is a wrapper for the input input text. So what is the input tag? Input uh, is self-explanatory that people, you, you can type input, so it's called input tag. So actually there are two inputs here, there's the enter guess. So because input has its own set of attributes, there are actually many different type of input elements that you can create. But for the purposes of this guess the number game, only we're going to have two. One is uh, the number, because you're trying to guess a number, and one is a submit, which looks like this. So only two input and we can style these inputs accordingly. So if you want to actually play the game, right, the, the special thing about the input number element is that if you use your keyboard, right, you can actually, you will actually go up and down, is uh, you can have these numbers inside. So this is why I say it's good to use the correct HTML tag because if you just put a normal input if you never specify a number and then you just put input type text, you will not get the. When when I try to uh, use my keyboard up and down, oh, the, there's no number one because this field is not a number field. It's like as if you use when you use Microsoft Excel, then you format the cell similar. So I want my input field to be a number. So I'm gonna change it back. So we'll cover this later, and then later when you win, there's another page. Uh, so we go back to the first page first, which is corresponds to the index.html. So the first thing that we go that um, we want to change is this part. Why do I want to change this part? If you remember when I was talking a lot of nonsense just now, the I talked about block and inline elements, right? So in the in our target, we want like each element, so this guess the number, this instruction, this ready to play, each of them, we want them to take up the entire space of the entire container. So right now it doesn't. Right now if you notice, right, ready to play and start the game on the same line. So let's let's change that. So what we do is, the reason why they're on the same line is because this ready to play and the link for start the game, right, they're all within the same paragraph tag. Meaning, you think of it as they are both in the same container. But we don't want it like that. We want the link to have its, to be its own container. So what we can do is we you make let's make ready to play its own element. So what we do is we add the closing tag at the end of the question mark. And remember to delete the other, the original closing tag. So the good thing about using nitrous is that there's this color. Uh, so when just now when I had extra extra closing tag, right, the rest of the tag was gray. So that like it's like it's an indication that hey, something's not really right. But once I've deleted the closing tag, then everything became white again. So you can use the color as a visual indicator, because for when we when we are coding. When we are writing code, right, especially like maybe HTML, or we will have to type things like this um, equal sign, we have to have these uh, brackets and these double quotes. Sometimes we'll miss out. And if, you're, if, if, you're, if your text editor doesn't have this color, coded, uh, color coding uh, functionality, right, you might miss it. Because there, there's a lot of times I typo, then I forgot to add a, a, a closing code, then my, my code look really weird. But because of the color thing, actually you can just try. So if you just remove the double quotes, you'll see that the color changes. The whole thing is yellow. So there's an indication that hey, you probably typoed something wrong. And once you put it back, the color reverts. So we, you can use this to help us. So for now, um, can everybody if everybody uh, manages to get their code look at least ready, right? You save and then you you refresh and see how it looks. 
So um, if all is well, the start of the game should have like moved itself downstairs. If nobody raised hand, continue. So okay, we have that. Um, so I want to introduce a per so I want to introduce another concept known as classes. Um, yes, please. Sorry, what? Uh, does anybody else have an internet problem? Organizer! Organizer! Siao Leo! Bo internet! Is anybody trying to watch Olympics? No? No? No, it's everybody connected to IDA lab, uh, 4, labs 4. <laughs> IDA labs 4, no. Eh, no internet fail eh. I know. Uh, who don't have internet, raise up your hand. Yeah, you could uh, it's okay. Hold on them into one table or like, share with your so, friend. So for the three people three individuals without without um, internet, can you keep your hand raised? There's more than three, yeah. So you also don't have internet. Okay. So um can try switching it switching your Wi-Fi off and on again. Does it work? From your phone? <laughs> Okay, so you can you try and data from your from your phone then. If you cannot, then I will pair you up with someone with a working laptop. Okay, continue. Okay. Okay, we're back from our technical difficulty. So I'm gonna introduce um, all of us all, all of you to the concept of a class. So a class is another type of HTML attribute. And what it allows you to do it is allows you to specify a specific element. Because how it works is that if you if you not notice this example, right, there are multiple P elements. So let's say I want to I want to so-called target the first the first P element. I can't do that because um, there are two there are two elements that are P elements. So what, 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 what can I do? I can I can give each of these elements a class. So that's the concept of class. Um, okay, 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 okay. Very, very quickly. Let's skip all this. So a class will look like this. I, I, I'm switching the slides just to show how it looks like, right? So you can a, a class is um is very is used when we write CSS. So what CSS stands for is cascading style sheets, and it allows us to add different style related attributes to our HTML elements. So you can apply CSS in three different ways. So you can either match the element. So as I just now I mentioned, there there were two P elements on the page. So if I style the P element, it will apply to all the P elements. If I only wanted to style one P element and not another, I will give the P element I want to target a class. And then I will style that class. There's another attribute called an ID, which is even more specific in the sense that for class, right, you can have elements with the same class. Meaning I can have two P elements that are called monkey. But if I'm using an ID, ID is unique. It's like your IC number. For Singapore, you are the only one with your IC number. So when you when you give an element an ID, that ID can only be used once. So if I name my element chicken, only can have one chicken. Okay. So that's the that's a brief introduction. Um. So let's say I want. To okay, let, let's see about like target. Okay, she looks exactly the same. Uh, okay, so 
as I mentioned just now, right, we have multiple pages we need to start. So there's the, the title one, then there's also the when you actually start playing the game. So the, the CSS that we write will apply to all three pages. So as you can see, right, there's also H1, there are also H1 elements in the in the play file. So for the for, for the target end result, this guess the number is very, very big. But when I start the game, I go in. Oh, I also don't have internet. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. So this this H one right is uh, smaller. So that means I cannot only apply my style to the H one element. I need to sort of like differentiate them. So what we are going to do is for the the one on the title, the index HTML. Let's give this H1 a class. So I'm going to call it title. Whoops, sorry. So for a class, for all attributes, right, the value of the attribute, it must be enclosed within, um, what's it called? Uh? Quotes, yes, quotes. Uh, so again, make sure you've got open quotes. Uh, opening and closing so that the, it's yellow. If the whole thing turns yellow, you probably forgot to close something. So now that we've given it a class, we can apply a style to it. So if you just save it, right, and you refresh, nothing's going to happen because you haven't done anything to it yet. But what we've done is we've given this H1 class a title. So what we can do is, let's go to our style.css file. It's empty for now. Completely empty. So what we can do is we can start styling the element. So the first thing we, let, let's try making something happen. So in order to target a class, you need to have this dot in front. Dot title. So this is how we target a, a class. If you only wanted to, if you wanted to target an element alone, then you don't need the dot, just the element. So a CSS rule basically is made out of this. There's uh, the selector. This, this, this is, I ref will refer to this as a selector. A, a dot title, so the title class is selector. H1 element is a se selector. And you will put all your so-called styling rules between these curly braces. So for the, the, the formatting is as follows. It mu you, you must have a opening curly brace followed by a closing curly brace. And the first thing I want to do is I want to make the font size big. So uh, font size is controlled by this attribute, uh, this property called font dash size. So font size is a CSS property. So there are many CSS properties that, that, that we can use to make the site uh, uh, look different. So this is just one of them. So it's, it's called font size. The, the syntax is as follows. Your property must be followed by a colon. It is a colon, it's not a semicolon. This is very important. Colon. And then the, the, the text in pink, that is the value. So this va after this value, you must have a semicolon. The reason for this is you can apply multiple properties to the same selector. So how do you, how does the browser know that this is the end of a value and the start of a new value? It recognizes the semicolon. So sometimes, Shift plus. Wrong. <laughs> Shift. Voila, voila.
I need to start that. Well, yeah, I need to start that. Is this better? <coughs> yeah, what's simple? Uh? Shift alternate, is it? I think it's option. Shift option, huh? <coughs> shift alternate, can you know, uh? Shift control. Shift control, uh? Oh, la 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 la. Uh. Sorry, ah. Uh. <laughs> Actually, at home, I'm a Windows user, okay? I closeted Windows user. <laughs> okay, so, so what we can do is, let's save this file. Save the file already. When we refresh, it should be very big. Or oh, it's not. Uh, where are? Hmm. Hi. have this problem where you save ready then it doesn't show up? Yes. Uh, okay, uh, if you're on a Mac, command shift R. If you're on Windows, control shift R. Potentially, there are potentially two issues. If you cannot see it, is the first thing is did you save the file, and the second thing is, unfortunately, when we do the refresh here, right, we cannot just do the normal refresh. We have to do a uh, Control Shift R or Command Shift R, depending on your operating system. There's an explanation for this, but I'm not going to go into it. Just take it as it is. Like this is why the sky is blue. Um, okay, so now now we have our super big title text, which is. And, and what you can do is, when you click on the start to get, start the game link, you'll notice that it didn't affect, it didn't affect the H1 on the other page. But if you want to try something funny, just to make sure that the, you, you understand, or you, you go to the, you, you go to your H1 tag, the H1 tag, and then you just change the color. Change the color to anything, and uh, please note that because we are Queen's English, unfortunately we have to use American spelling C O L O R, no U. <laughs> uh, and you, uh, the, the, the fun part about CSS is that um, for the more common colors like red, blue, green, orange, or you can actually type the, the word uh, instead of the hex code because uh, for more specific color shape you need to use something called hex code I'll talk about that later but for now just testing uh, we are not going to keep this rule and if you save this right and you refresh both pages should have green text so this one is green and if we go back this one also is also green but we, we, we let, let's not make it green it's just, just it is just to prove a point okay so uh, let's let's remove this and save again so, so that's the difference between uh, how specific we want to be when we are styling our text. So the next, the next thing we can do is there is a background image for the app. So here is where I'm going to introduce another rule. Um, but the back, okay, this part. This part, you're just, just, just trying to copy the code uh, and I will explain what's going on.
Uh, okay, I, I'm going to quick, quickly explain this, but if you don't understand, never mind. Because it's not entirely crucial. But um, I'm going to do something. I'm going to open this this thing called an inspector. So as if you continue to build websites, you will use this particular function very often. It's when you right click your browser and you click on inspect. It should pop up this um, window. And as you can see, what it does is it shows you the code of your website. And uh, if you're using Chrome, the, 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 the good thing is that when you highlight a particular line, it shows you exactly what element that you're pointing to. So when I highlight the HTML element, the whole thing is blue. Then like the H1, it highlights it in blue. So the orange bits uh, is called a margin, which I'll talk about later. So you can, you can see, when I hover over HTML, right, the blue part only uh, takes up the, is about the size of the four lines that are on the screen right now. But if I want to apply a background image, I want it to be the full screen, all the way until the bottom. I, I don't want there to be this white space in between. So that's the reason why I ask you all to set HTML height to 100% and uh, the body height to 100%. What these rules do is that, now that I've saved it, It's now the full, it now refers to the full uh, height of the container. So now, then we can start, we can put in our background image. So, we want to put the back, we want to apply the background image to the body element. So, we space down. Uh, the background property we're going to be using is called background image. Like just now, I actually thought, mistakenly thought it was background IMG. Huh? It's actually, it's grey. So I'm like, hey, okay, wrong, wrong, wrong. So if you type image, then it becomes green, then you know that like, you typed it correctly. So for background image, the syntax is this. Because we want to tell the, we want to tell the browser uh, where to find the image file they want to use for the background image. So the, so you need to add, a, you just type URL, then um, parentheses and use finish typing so what we uh, you can choose what file you want to use uh, that's inside this uh, image folder so I'm just going to use this one the funny looking one Oh, careful. Oh uh, okay, 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 I change, I change, I change, I change. Sorry, that was a bad. I didn't expect it to look so bad, sorry. It look better. Hey, but if any of your friends are using the purple hearts, you'll turn off at them, okay? Okay, so um, this is a dark background. So I want to bring everybody's attention to a particular point that happens when we design websites is that 
for legibility purposes, we really need to consider contrast. So this is a very prime example. Black text on dark background is the worst idea on the planet because nobody can read whatever it is. So what we can do is that let's switch, let's make the text, let's make the text color light. And another concept I want to introduce is the fact what, 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 what we mean by cascading style sheets. So if you notice the hierarchy of the text on your element, you, you, if you think of text as containers, you, we can safely say that all these elements, the H1, the P, they are wrapped within the body container. So how this works is that what, um, in most cases, uh, again, not all, uh, but in most cases, a rule that applies to the parent container will so-called cascade to all its children. So, be I'm being lazy, I'm going to uh, apply the color property to the body. So, the H1 the, and the P inside will all inherit from this, the parent. So, let's do this. So, um, I didn't apply anything to the H1 or the P, but they are also white because they inherited from their parent. So, that's, that's something that... That's something to take note that uh, if you find uh, that your styles don't, don't behave the way you expect them to, you may have, uh, have this, this situation where the children have inherited some properties that the parent has. If this doesn't make sense to you, it's not it's not mission critical. So we have this. Uh, if you notice, as I mentioned, it, it in general most cases the child will inherit from the parent, but not all. So if you notice, right, the link, the A tag, it didn't inherit. The reason is because the browser, right, if you, when we didn't style anything at all, before when the style.css was completely empty, you notice that the, because we, we used H1 text, we used A text, we used P text, right, that there was already some formatting, meaning your H1, the H1 element was already bigger and bold as compared to the other elements. And the A tag already had this blue, it was already blue and had this underline. That's because the browser has a set of default styles. It's, it's basically, when, when you declare is, uh, to the browser that this is a HTML file, right? It already, oh, okay, because you are a HTML file, I have some styling for you already. So that's, that's the reason why I want to declare, declare the, the HTML file, so that the browser knows how to So browser actually applies some base styles. This is a good thing, or it could also be a bad thing, because sometimes, the, the browser applies styles that you don't want. So you will have to so-called overwrite those styles. So the browser by default has already set the link color to blue and mo most of us should be familiar with the fact that links are blue because almost all browsers set it like that. But we don't, we don't want it to be blue. We want it to be... Actually, it's going to look different. Okay, I, I should follow this. So if you want to use the black background, I use the black background, okay? I, I go back to get this to this light background, then I'll change it back to black. I want my so I want to I want to target this link. I want to make it look like the button that this purple button that I start here. Purple button, purple button. So what I'm gonna do is a class is good because you can apply the same class to different elements and the same styles will apply. So how is this relevant? If you go to the the second file that we haven't changed yet, which is the play.erb file. This is the this is the file with the I'm thinking of a number content, right? You'll notice that the submit button, we want we want to make it look like the purple button also. 
So what we can do is, I will come back, we will come back to this page later, but you will find that the class will help us to style the button. So you keep that in mind first, but what we will do now is, let's give this A element a class called button. So once you've done that, right, let's go back to the style.css so we can style the button. Yeah, 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 yeah. So each each uh, each property, each style property does one thing only. So if we look at the target, you can see that okay, the background is purple, the text is white, and um, okay, when you hover right, this color change. Uh, should I cover this? Okay, we ignore the color change first. But okay, we, we notice that there is no underline. The original one, right? The text is purple and then there's underline. So what we want to do is we want to remove the underline. We want to make it white and we want to give it a purple background. Okay, so these are the things that we want to do to it. And these are the corresponding rules that we should have. So, so okay. Let's make the color white first. One thing that I, one mistake that I tended to, to make all the time when I started is that for text, right, the property name is color. For some very weird reason, I don't know why my brain is like that, I always put text color and then it will be wrong. So just something to take note of is color. And background, for the background, then you have to use background dash color. Um, that's just the, that's just the way that they name the property. So. Sometimes if you get stuck, maybe check your property names. Sometimes you may have used the wrong property. Um, the, this, this third line here, the text dash decoration none, this is the rule that removes the underline. So if you have typed these three rules and you saved it already, your button should have, you, you should have something that looks like a bit, of, a bit like a button. So we're almost there. It's just that you realize there's, um, the background is hugging the text. So what we need to do is that we need to give the, we need to give this element some padding. Okay, before we move on, I want to mention this value that I've been using. It's called EM. So an EM is a unit of measure. It's like pixels, PX is pixels, CM is centimeter. Uh, so EM is pronounced M. Uh, it's a <laughs> sorry. It's a it's, it's basically it's, it's a unit of measure and it's um if, if any of you have graphic design background, then you know that it's actually the, it's a, it's a typographic uh, term uh, that, that refers to the, the width of the letter M for that particular font. But just think of it, uh, it's, it's another unit. So like one pixel is one, the, the width of one pixel. So one M is actually the, the value of the default font size. So what, what do I mean by default font size? Um, the browser applies a default font size to all text and that default font size is... Okay, 
Okay, don't display. The default font size that the browser gives all text is 16. Um, when you add a H1, for H1 text, it's double, 2N, which actually translates to 32. So by default, the text, um, like for example, when you use Microsoft Word, the, your default your default text size is either 10 or 12 pixels, right? So for, for, for uh, what browsers do, if you, if you don't specify, right, the default is 16 pixels. So when I use 1M, right, 1M refers to 16 pixels. So when I put a padding of 1M, it just means a padding of 16 pixels around the element. So there's, there are two ways to add space to your elements. One is what we did just now, padding. There's another, one, there's another property called margin. So the difference between padding and margin is that padding, whatever uh, the, the so-called amount of padding you add applies to the element itself. But when you're using margin, it's the distance between itself and other elements. So the best way is an example. So if you notice right, this ready to play and start the game is, is a bit too close for my liking. So let's add a margin of 1.5 add. Okay, I'm sorry, explaining the rule. Uh, as if you can still remember what I said before the break, I said that elements, uh, there are two types, there are inline elements and there are block elements. So one of the quotes is that you cannot, uh, margin bottom doesn't work on inline elements. And by default, a link is an inline element. So now, because margin only applies to block level elements, I have to declare that I want this button to become a block element. And I do that using yet another CSS property called display. If some of you feel like giving up and throwing your laptop at me, I will not blame you, but this is another property that we need to use. Basically, I'm declaring that the button element needs to behave like a block. Why is it called inline block? What it does is, okay, and this might sound confusing, is that it will retain, so it will, the, the browser will treat it like a block, meaning it allows it to take up space, the width of the container, but it also keeps some of its inline properties. So if you notice what I typed just now, like when I just type block, right, the element really dutifully took up the entire width of the page. But I don't want this. I want it to sort of still behave kind of inline-ish. Okay, this is the most terrible explanation on the planet. But um, when you use inline block, it sort of it, it behaves like a block, but it also retains some of its some of the original inline properties. Uh, there's a better explanation for this, but uh, just look for me afterwards. I'll give you a long, nice long explanation. So okay, it, it's, it's closer to what we want already. So the target is everything is center aligned. So again, the next thing we can do is, because everything is center aligned, then what we, we the same thing as when we did the, the color example just now is, let's just make everything center aligned on the parent. All CSS rules use American spelling, so it's T E R, not T R E.
So, ta-da! Okay, one more thing we can do to make the site pretty is the font is different. Um, typography deserves its own workshop. So I will actually just touch and go on this and play cheat by using Google Fonts. So, uh, okay, I have the link. The, if you go to Google Fonts, right, you can pick some other fonts and you can copy direct from Google. Let, let, let's do that. Let's just all go to Google Fonts and pick fonts together. <laughs> for, for fonts in general, we because font files are... Uh, from the fonts themselves, they don't magically appear. Each of these fonts right, have a, uh, uh, contained in files. And these files do, do have a size. So the more font files you, the more fonts that you use, right, it means that your web page has to load more fonts. So if you can imagine, like if you go to a website, if you have a slow connection and then you go to a website, sometimes you'll see that the text is uh, the, the unstuck, the, the normal font, the system font text. Then, like, after you read halfway the article, it's only shoo, you were like, oh, new font. So, actually, that, that, that kind of behavior is a bit jarring. And usually it happens, okay, number one, you are on a slow connection, but it's also an indication that if you really, it's like you use like about six or seven fonts and you're loading a lot of font files, right, it will slow your whole site down. And then your, your text, because if the font file doesn't load, the browser will just use the default default style first. Then the moment the style loads, you will you will you will like apply it, and it's a very jolting experience. So generally, what we we suggest is you know keep it to one or two, three ish. So, um, general guideline for picking fonts, it's to a certain extent is a is a it's sort of what looks right, but. Um, a, a guideline would be to choose, if you're going to use two fonts, you want them to complement each other, right? A simple way is to choose a font from different uh, different typeface styles. I mean, what, what do I mean? For example, this, if, uh, the fonts that don't have those uh, serifs at the end, these are sen sans serif fonts. So, Usually you just pick a serif font and pair it with a sans serif font. Uh, let's not make this a graphic design course. So uh, I'm not going to care and I'm not going to judge whatever fonts you want to pick. If you want to use Comic Sans, go ahead. I will not judge, I promise. So just pick two fonts that you like. Or you can, you can just use one font, that's also fine. But uh, so how, how, how Google Fonts work is that you just add to collection. So then there's a pop-up at the bottom, right? Then you just click on use. So you can choose weights. So the weights actually each weight is a own uh, own each, each weight is its own font file. So the if you choose all the weights, right, they actually tell you also this word, this meter will go all the way to the red. So in most normal circumstances, we only need at most maybe one <coughs> bold and one italic. Uh, for my for for the the the, the font that I choose, I only use one single weight. So up to you. Uh, you wanna, you really wanna choose all of them? You can also choose. Uh, I'm not gonna judge you lah. Um, so the way, the most important part is you copy the code from here. So click on the import tab. Uh, you will auto select the whole thing. Just copy and paste over. Based on the very very top of your styles.css file. So it should look something like this. Um, So in my example, I pick two fonts. If you only pick one font, that's fine also. But take note of the name of the font. So I pick two fonts. One is called the Vala one. Uh, the other one is called Average. So I I use the Vala one for my header and I use Average for the rest of my text. So how do we change the font? Um, because the most of 
the body, general body of my text, I want it to use the average form. So this is what I do. actually you can copy from Google also. See? So you can just uh, copy and paste into your CSS if you don't want to type. Um, one thing to note, because I picked a font that had uh, two words in its name, so ideally you will want to sort of put, put them in quotes. Normally, if you don't if you don't put it in if you don't put your properties in quotes, um, spaces are spaces are not processed spaces are not processed properly. So just just remember to have the quotes, or just 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 copy from Google Fonts is the safest. So once we have applied our fonts and refresh. We should almost be there. I'm going to cut for intermission so Sunny can explain why things are not working. Uh, okay guys, um, some of you are facing this. Uh, can I just stop? Can everyone hear me at the back? How about that? Can you hear me? Fantastic. Okay, cool. Um, so Hui Jing is going to hate me for a while. Because, you know, two minutes on stage and I'm already breaking things. Break everything. Okay, cool. Um, some of you... Wait, so I don't see what I see here. Nope. Oh, man. Flexible. Okay, okay, okay. Turn around, turn around. Turn around, okay. Hope so. Okay, okay. Hey, Sorry, this is a much better idea. I should have done this things. just now. Oh my god, I feel like a moron. <laughs> oh no, okay. Some of you might see my ass, but okay. Let me scroll down. Okay, so... Um, What's happening, right, is that some of you see this all of a sudden, right? How many of you have been seeing this all of a sudden? And how many of you are panicking? All of you, okay, cool. Um, this means that your server is not running, right? Waging ran through with you what a client and what a server is, right? So when you see this, what's happening is you're telling, you as a client are telling the server, can you serve me my, app, my web page? Server says, I don't know what you're talking about. Turns you, and this is what you get. Right? So you need to get your server up and running such that when, when you tell the server, hey, I need my page, the server will be like, oh, yeah, sure. Let me just pass it to you. Yeah? So let's see how we get that done. So, one of the things that you guys do is to run your bundle execute ruby dot slash app dot rb. Yes? To start your server. So what do you think will happen when I do it now? Error. Does this look familiar to most of you? Some of you might not be able to see it, so let me just, uh, this is maximize. Yeah. Yes. Some of you, how, how many of you is this familiar? A lot of you, right? I'm assuming this, this. Maybe some blocking some of them. Could not locate gem file or Ruby bundle directory. Right? Yes, no? Cool, yes. So the issue is, right, it is what it is. It's saying I, as the terminal, think of the terminal as your, your butler, right? Really, this guy has got a lot of powers. Um, so you are telling terminal, I need you to tell bundle to execute Ruby on this file. So now he says, hey, I cannot find the damn file. So what, how, how do I tell, you know, how do I execute? What do I execute on? <laughs> I so, I beat you. <laughs> so now we are going to find our way around into fixing this. Okay, step one. You want to ask Terminal, okay, Terminal, where are you and what files do you see? To do that, I tell Terminal, Terminal, list me my files. So when I say list, it's ls, right? Easy to remember? ls. What does he say? He says, oh, I see code. 
right? So essentially what you would be looking at, right, is this. So I'm just going to try and show it to you the way the computer sees it. This is what the computer sees. Right now, you are here, and you're asking, can you run app dot, uh, run the execute uh, on app.rb? He says, I only can see this file. I can't see the rest of my files. Right, so what, what can I run? I can't run anything. So I'll tell you, hey, I cannot find it. So then you tell, OK, LS, uh, OK, Terminal, since you cannot see that file, let's, let's go and find that file. So you tell it, let's change our directory. Right? So to, to change a directory, CD. It's brilliant, right? Uh, list is LS, change a directory is CD. Right, so OK, let's go and change our directory. So a few tricks that programmers use, just to make yourselves feel cool. Huh? Some of you will go out and will say, hey, CD into code, right? Most of you will. Here's the cool one. You press C, one of the first letters, and you press tab. And you'll find for you that file. It's magical, I'm telling you. Right? See, see again, huh? Point, point. Uh, you point, you point. point. Yeah, sorry, uh, guys or girls. <laughs> okay, so first thing I did was what? To say, uh, Terminal, can you find me my files? What files are you looking at? He says code, right? So next, you say, okay, now that you see code, let's go into code. I CD, I type C, right? And then I tab. And then you say, hey, uh, there's code. So let's go into code. Magic, <laughs> right? Okay, now you're in code. What do you want to do next? What would, what would you want to do next? You try and run bundle again, huh? What do you think will happen? What do you think will happen when I run bundle? Oh, okay. Uh, wait, uh, let me just increase the height of this so that it comes closer. Okay. So now you're in code, huh? and then we run this. And he, again, he says, hey, I cannot find app. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I cannot find app.rb. Why? So you ask him again, OK, what can you see? What would you use? You'd use ls, right? List me all my files. You'll say, oh, I can see guess the numbers in our truck. So like, OK, fine. Let's go in into guess the number. So a few times I've been helping some of you here and then you're like, oh, god damn it. Guess the number. No, you don't need to do that. You just type GU and then you tap and then magic. <laughs> yeah? So you say, okay, let's go into guess the number. So now, uh, what you're going to see, right? What the computer might see, right, is this. All of this, most of this. Uh. So let's see what the computer sees. I type ls. Do you see the app.rb? Correct. So the app.rb is there. So now if I tell the terminal, can you? Oh, yeah, this is the other trick. Some of you are like, hey, what was the comment? What was the, the code that I need to run? Then you go and you open your browser and then you try and find which damn tab it is on. You don't need to do that because. The terminal was programmed by a bunch of lazy people. So what you want to do is this. Press the up arrow or the down arrow. And he will remember all your commands. Oh. Yeah? OK? Cool things like this. Now, if I press Enter, what's going to happen? Magic. Magic. Press Enter. Yay. The application is up and live. It's here, right? Yeah. And voila. Okay, so for the rest of you who face this issue, I expect you to be able to do it by yourself now. <laughs> no, uh, if, you, if you face the issue, if you need me to run through it with you guys again, let me know. So remember, it's two commands that you need to understand. LS is list whatever I'm looking at. CD is to change a directory. Other than that, then you should be fine. So just change the directory and find your files before you run it. One last thing. Uh, let me just close this up. Uh, oh, command. Uh, screen. How do I clear that? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah.
Ah, fantastic. Okay. Again, uh, just to dissect what this is doing, just so that you guys understand. The telling bundle to execute Ruby on this file, add the RB. Don't always go and use this because this has got a special meaning. This means find this file in my current directory, this directory. Okay? Anybody unsure, unclear of what's happening? All good? Yeah? So remember, this means, so what essentially, the, essentially what the computer is going to do, right, is it's going to, when you do that, and you say that, run this command, right, and, and you put a dot slash, it's going to go to the top of the file, and go down one by one, finding your file. So this has got special meaning. So you need to, be under, you need to understand that this, uh, when to use it, when not to use it. Okay, you want to use it when you are in the file and you're saying, find this file for me, then you use this. Cool? Everybody understands? Cool? Okay, fantastic. Okay, and then we back to waiting. Hey guys, those. <laughs> Set up good. And now back. And now back to your regularly scheduled programming. Me. Enter. Okay, okay. So, okay, we got this part ready. So let's go. Let's move on to the next page that we need to start. So everybody just click start the game. So you're moving on to the next page. And uh, a lot of the things, as I mentioned just now, right, because this same CSS file is loaded for all three of the sites, you'll notice that a lot of the things that we did for the first page actually already applies here also. So like the background image, um, the centralized, and the fonts, right, it, already, uh, it, it also applies to, the, to this, this page as well. So we don't have to do that. The only thing we need to do is that uh, we have to deal with this input and this, uh, these two inputs. So. So now, index.html file, we are, we are done with this. You want to close it, it's fine. You want to leave it open, it's also fine. But let's open. It's inside the views and play.erb. So if you double click, it should open. And it should look almost exactly the same. It's just that the content is different. So we have. So we're probably not going to, we're probably not going to touch the H1 and the H2s because um, they're kind of already stuck. So let's focus our attention on this part, the form element. So the, the form element essentially, as I mentioned, is a, is a wrapper. And input elements generally, generally we have label, the label tag and the input tag inside. In this particular case, let's focus in on this input type number. So this actually, this input type number actually corresponds to this, this input field. So this is the default input field without any styling. Uh, I mean, with just the browser's default styling. And you'll notice that the input actually is a HTML element that has a quite, a, quite a number of attributes. So I'm just going to briefly touch on what these attributes are. So earlier, when I demonstrated, right, one of the attributes is called type. And there are quite a number of input types. So the, the most common input type because I'm sure a lot of us, I, when you all sign up for your GitHub Nitro account, you'll fill a form, right? Yeah. So the most common input element, uh, input type is actually text. So is, that's, that's, that's all it does. You just input text into the view. That's, that's all. But you also have um, more specific types. So in this example, we're using number. So if you try to enter text, Try to enter text. Okay, you, you can see what I'm doing, but I'm trying to press a letter. Nope, doesn't work. Because it's a number field, it only accepts numbers. You can try, try, try. Just type something, anything. If it's not a number, it won't appear. And all input fields also should have a name. Uh, name attribute. So 
in most cases, like the reason why we have form elements in our website is because we want to collect some user input. Uh, like GitHub wanted to collect your name and your email and your password. So if you think about it, right, when I click submit, what actually happens? Uh, it, it's not that the, because this form and whatever I'm doing for styling, right, it's for humans, it's for people, it's for people to see. But if you're a computer, you don't really care about how the website looks like. You only care about the data. I only, if I'm the, I'm the computer who's supposed to process your, your information, I only care about the whatever you feel inside the fields. So how, let's say, for example, in the GitHub sign up, I'm not sure, maybe there are four or five fields, but how would I know which data correspond to what field? So in a sense, the name attribute sort of is a sort of label, identifies the field. So when I give a name called guest number, what the what the server recognizes is is that okay in this field called guest number the value is okay, twenty one for example if I put in twenty one and I submit, so the 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 backend server will will be able to recognize that okay the um, the guest number field had a value of twenty one. So when you entered your first name and your last name and your email the server will recognize, oh, there were three fields. The field, depending on what the, the developers named the name, let's assume they named it first name, last name, and email, then they will know that, oh, first name was Hui Jing, last name was Chen, email was whatever, whatever, dot com. So that's, that's why we, sh we need to have a name attribute in the input field. Uh, placeholder is uh, another attribute that allows you to put in, it is very small. But let you all look at your own screen, okay? Uh, you'll see that the input field has this text called enter guess. So the the data, meaning the text that's inside this this like grey faded out placeholder text actually comes from this placeholder attribute. So you can if you want to change the the text inside the the field to something else like enter enter your favorite number or whatever. You can just change um, whatever is inside the, the, the value of the placeholder field. You can do that if you want. Um, autofocus, ah, as you notice, right, for all the other attributes, there's a value, but autofocus doesn't have a value. Because autofocus is a particular attribute that doesn't need a value. Basically, what it does is that it tells the browser that when you, when you load, when the page loads by default, make the field active. For example, okay, this may not this may not be very evident here because it's only one field. But in the future, if you're building other forms uh, and you have multiple fields, maybe you want a particular field to be highlighted. That means the the moment that the the page loads, you want that particular the cursor to be blinking on that particular field. You put auto focus on that field. So, from a logic perspective, you only want to put auto focus on one field. If you autofocus many fields, uh, I think the default behavior is you will take the first one. So it will be defeat the purpose also. Um, and if you think about it, like, eh, why, why do I need autofocus? I can just, you know, I can, I can just go my mouse click also the same thing. Ah, but if you think about it, right, um, like for example, because I play sports, right, then like every other day is injured one. So imagine if you, like, you, you, sort of twist, your, your wrist got injured or arm injured and you maybe that day you cannot use a mouse. So maybe you, you only want you only want to use your keyboard because your head very pain. So if, if you cannot use a mouse, right, then it's, this is a convenience. Once I load the page, oh, it's already, it, it, the, that field is already highlighted so I can start typing and then I use tab to move on to the next field. It's, a, it's, a, it's something we take for granted when everything is well, but my, my, per, my perspective on this is, all of us right now, right, we're all temporary able people. Meaning there will come a day that okay, if you're s you you may on um, you, you may be like okay like I like mentioned, oh I sprained my wrist. you then you'll be disabled for that day. Or like now now okay, now now I, I'm twenty nine years old, but like let's say fifty years down the road then I'm eighty years old and I um I'm 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 blind. Then all of us are actually just temporarily able. So I think we need to keep in mind that when we are building, when we are designing websites and we are building stuff, right, 
not everybody can do everything that we can do and we need to keep these people in mind also because we, we want them to be able to use the same things that we, we use also and, and if you build something with access so whatever I mentioned just now is called something is called accessibility when we build with accessibility in mind it doesn't only benefit um, people with disabilities for us it, it, it also makes the website better so it's actually a plus plus for everybody with, if we if we design with accessibility in mind so anyway moving back here the target that we have in mind is like I mentioned right just now why is this so small very small too small we don't like this let's make it big so how do we make this big as big as this Now, if you notice there are two input fields, even though they are different types, right? The browser will still, if you apply a style to just the input element, the browser will try to apply to both elements. So what we want to do is, we also want to give this input field a class. So let's, I'm lazy and my brain don't want to think, I'm just going to call it guess number also. No, actually I'm just going to call it guess. Oh, I'm so lazy. If one day you already decide like you wanna like build websites more seriously, um, you'll find yourself be very frustrated with CSS. I personally love CSS, but a lot of people tell me that they hate CSS. Then I'm like, mm, okay, lol. But so one of the quirks is that to control guess or your net to control the size of guess, intuitively you might say you might think, uh, okay, like use uh, what type of property would correspond. Mm, maybe height yes height will work but there's uh, how do how do we put this there are actually multiple properties that can achieve the same effect so let's try using height because uh, the end end goal i won't be using height la. let's try using height and see what happens Okay, if you use height, yes, we can make the input field like sort of bigger. But when you try to type something, right, the text size is still really, really tiny. So it's like, we did not really the effect that we are looking for. So instead, okay, let, let, let's think about this. Uh, font size, right? Font size is controlled by font size. So let's try font size. font size is a better idea in this case because what it does is that the font size will control the size of uh, the text in whatever you input inside the field and how, how HTML behaves is that generally speaking the container will take the, the height or width of, of what's inside so we end up having to use the font size which is a bit counterintuitive instead of height to change the size of this input. Uh, so again, you know, it is, it is the type of things that you will get used to, like experience really helps in this kind of situation, but if you're first starting out, then you'll feel like throwing your laptop out the window. Please don't do that, your laptop is very expensive. So now we have the same issue as when we first started, whereby the, the guess, the, the next element is uh, in line with it. So we want to fix that. So the original, the original button was a, a was an A element. It was a link. But in the second page, it's now an input. So again, this is input type 
app submit is another type of input and the browser applies some default styles to the, the input type to make it look like a button. And this is what we want to override. So instead of typing everything again, what we're going to do is we're going to give that this submit input the same class that we gave the button in the first in the first page. So just give class button refresh. So this is why I say uh, using a class is helpful is because the moment once you have like written the rules once this button or this set of six rules you can reuse these styles again in other elements by just giving them that same class. So that, that's helpful. Um, so input again by default is a inline element. So let's make guess a block element. So this part may or may not be confusing, but it may make a bit more sense if I show you. So now that I made it a block element, it dutifully takes up the entire width of the uh, container. But we want it to we want it to be center aligned. So the technique that we use to make block elements center aligned is to use, uh, we call it the margin technique because margin is the margin uh, padding these are properties that take in length values so like, uh, like 1 m that's, that, that's the one, one unit of measure right so for, for padding I didn't mention this just now so I mentioned it now right padding alone by itself is a uh, it by default will take all four. So an element has top, bottom, left and right. If I only use padding, it applies to all four sides. If you notice for margin, right, I actually explicitly say uh, margin bottom. So then this 1.5 EM only applied to the bottom. So uh, what you can do in CSS is that for padding, right, there's something called a shorthand. So let's say I want the top and bottom to be 1M, but left and right, I want it to be 2M. I can write it like this. This shorthand, there's a lot of combinations that, because, okay, I'm just gonna confuse everybody by saying this. You can actually enter three values, and how it works is that this actually means that top is 1M, left and right is 2M, bottom is 0 0.5 m. The orientation actually is clockwise. So you, you, there, are, there are four sides, right? What this means is, is red, top, right, bottom, left, um, clockwise direction. But to be honest, right, this took me forever to catch. Because when, when I started out, then I, I used to copy and paste other people's code because I don't know how to write my own code, so I just copy and paste. Then other people would write point three values and some point two values and like how oh, come the values all so funny one? So it, it really it um eventually one day, one fine day you will get it, but um if you're confused now that's perfectly normal. So going back to this, I mentioned the, the so called center aligned margin trick. It not on, margin not only can take uh, explicit values, it can also take this value called auto. So what we do to, if we want to centralize a block level element is, we'll do this. What this does means that, um, so if it's a two value, the first, the first value applies to top bottom, the second value applies to left right. So when I put margin zero auto, it just means that top bottom no margin, but left and right, auto margin. And when you, when you apply auto margin, 
the browser distributes the amount of space uh, on the left and the right of that element uh, equally. So this is the trick that we use to, it's not a trick, uh, we call it a technique. It's a technique that we use to centralize block level elements. So if you notice that, okay, maybe setting zero for the margin bottom is not such a good idea. So what we can do is let's give it the same amount of margin as the first button in the first page. Yeah, too much. Oh, okay. Yeah, so something like this. So one, one more thing you'll notice is that your button kind of looks a bit smaller than the original. If you, if you go back, you can, if you, you press back, right, eh, the button was bigger. Again, this is simply because the browser has some default styles on, on all the different elements. And for input type submit, the browser has actually explicitly set the font size to be 10. So it's much smaller. So what we can do is, we could explicitly set the font size to 16 pixels, override it. Or we could also use another property, uh, which is called inherit. So it does what it does what it means. Basically, what it does is it will inherit the size of its parent, and because the default default uh, size for HD, uh, for HTML documents that that the browser applies sixteen pixels, when you you put font size inherit on button, and because we didn't explicitly say it will just take the default as sixteen. What the Pretend you don't see this. The reason why we use inherit instead of explicitly putting a, a font size is we are going to make use of the, the property of CSS in that child elements tend to inherit, can, can inherit the properties that its parents has. So a benefit is that, okay, suddenly one day I decide I don't want the default size to be 16 because my mother wants to play this game. My mother nearsighted, my mother cannot read 16 pixels. I want to make the text 22 pixels. So if I change the the base font size to something larger all, all the text will grow accordingly that's the benefit of using m's because M is a relative unit. What I mean relative unit means M refers, so when I started out and I said the default font size was 16 pixels and one M corresponds to 16 pixels, that's what it means. Everything is relative to that one, that default font size. So when I, I set the title to font size 5M, that means it's 80. Mental sums. And then for if I set something to font size 2M, it's 32. Now when I change the, the base font size to 22, everything increase in the same ratio. So now it's 110, I think. And uh, whatever was 2M was 44. So, so that's the advantage in that you don't have, if you actually explicitly say, oh, 60, p 60 pixels, and uh, maybe this one you, you say you put 30 pixels, and when you, when you change the, the base font size, or you have to actually go to each of these individual elements and, and change, like, change the font size manually. So a bit tedious. So if we want everything to grow, scale together, that's the benefit of using relative units. Um, so when you do font size inherit, same concept. So when, when I explicitly say font size inherit, it will inherit the the default font size by overriding. Because I said the default font, the default size that the browser gives it was 10. So I already override this file by saying font size inherit is like you take, don't don't cancel the 10, take whatever size the parent is. And so same same concept when I change upstairs, everything just change automatically. So that that's a that's a 
And uh, as you go along, you realize that some properties have uh, different values and, and this kind of thing. Again, I say it's, a, it's an experience thing. Uh. You, you, you cannot possibly expect to memorize all of this. I, the only reason I can write, I can type all this from memory is because I've been doing this. I, I, people actually pay me to do this for a living. Um, most of you probably don't get paid to do this for a living, so you definitely not expected to memorize this. Always Google, Google your friend. So the last page, the very, very last page that you want to style is the, the, the if you guess curly page, I'm not very good at Ruby, so I don't know how to hack this to, to get to that page by automatic. So what I did when I, when, I, when I tried this myself is I actually literally had to play the game. So maybe I can try playing the game now and try to get the correct, you know, try to get the correct number because I, uh, yeah, I, I don't have a good idea. I don't have a good solution for this. So I actually got to play this game. I'm sorry, I don't have a good idea. Oh, on the plus side, you can verify that the code actually works. <gasps> Why is this a game? Oh my god, so you did it. Okay, if you finally win, finally win, you will get to this screen. This is the win screen. Um, so, this, the, the content in the win screen corresponds to the win.erb file. So again, it will look very familiar. Looks almost exactly the same as the previous two files. And the content is just different. So again, you also have H1 and H2 elements and P elements. That's why the styling is already there. The only difference is that if you know, you've know you won the game after clicking, I clicked like six times, man. That was like such a big effort. You don't want to give people just this plain text. Let's give them an image. So what we're going to do is we're going to add an image um, to the file. So the image is uh, image is going to be a HTML element. So it's not it's not a CSS. So we'll be editing the win.erb file. So how do we add images to our website? We use the image tag. Okay, now image tag, right? Is not I M A G E. It's I M G. So it's another potential typo candidate. But um, if your image doesn't show up, maybe check that. So the image has, the image also has its own set of properties. Like just now I mentioned the input type had like name and stuff. So the image also has its own property. The important part for image uh, element is where, where is the image file. The browser needs to know where the image file is. So the, Im the, the key property is source, but it's spelled S-R-C, not S-O-U-R-C-E. Um, something to take note of. So because we already prepared the images for you, it's in the same file as the background images, so you just reference it. Uh, it's called trophy.svg. But, but one other important, very important attribute that all, uh, all images need to have is this attribute called Okay, everybody, somebody has taught me how to bypass the game. So, everybody, go to, app dot r go to the app.rb file and scroll down to line 55. Scroll, 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 okay. You all probably scrolled it. So, what you need... The mic hates me, eh? No? Okay. So... What you need to do is, just now it looks something. Just 
Just now it looks like the original file looks something like this. Please highlight from line 55 until line 59. Highlight so it should be a slightly different color. Then if you're on Mac, press com hold command and backslash, which is the key that has the question mark on it. If you are on Windows, use control. Hold control backslash. Um, it should automatically put all these uh, hash, uh, these hash uh, characters. You want to put one by one hash character also can. Then on line fifty six that says erb colon win right. Remove the remove the hash so it looks like this. So you have four grey outlines and one color line. Oh, you just change the play to win. Let's not confuse everybody. If you are stuck, your friendly assistant coaches will come and help you do this. So uh, just save the file and if you refresh, it should by default. The last bit already, so if everybody very sick, I want to go home already. Last, last bit, I promise, finishing already. start more but I'm just gonna move on because time is running out okay so I'm gonna go back here um, so what the odd pack does is that sometimes when you go to websites you'll realize that some images are broken so if you do not have an odd pack all your user sees is this blank space and that that's kind of it's, it's not so good because if the it's not advisable to put important information in an image file, but you know you, you wanna so for people for the for the image which doesn't load, you kinda still want to tell your users what the image was about, so maybe they can use their own imaginations to imagine what the picture could have been, as opposed to just giving them a blank space. So in this particular instance, I'm gonna put the alt as trophy so that in the event that somehow my image didn't load. Um, the user will kind of know that okay, there was supposed to be an image of a trophy here, and then he can imagine what a trophy looks like and make himself happy. So that's the importance of the alt tag. But as with all other HTML elements, you can also apply a class to image tag so that you can apply certain styles because you can also style an image one. So let's just put in a class called trophy first because we're, we're gonna have to apply some, some styles to the trophy. Okay, let, let's save it first and see how it looks. Ta -da! Okay, it's a bit huge. It's a bit too huge. So this is the reason why we added the class. So that we can go and target it and we can make it a more reasonable size.
得錯嚇。哦、oh, ，thanks。Oh my god， 我大個。So nice。Okay, so what we want to do is that we want to uh, set the height of the trophy. So you, okay, um, that's not you being in. So uh, depending on what you want, you can just set an arbitrary height, like maybe 400 pixels, 200 pixels, 500 pixels, whatever pixels. Just so set a height. So to to constrain, uh, to to just make it a fixed size. It's it's fine if you set this as a fixed size because it, it's an image anyway. So. Yeah, so if I set it to 400, it's going to be about this height. You can make it smaller, make it bigger, up to you. Doesn't matter. So now this looks like a more reasonable size. And lastly, the last thing, really promise this is last really, is the play again button. So again, this is just a plain link, right? So the solution to this is, the, you just have to add the class. Just add the class button to the... Yeah, that's it. That's done. So ideally, you should have had this end result. Yeah, so just nice. This is about the end, end of the workshop. And hopefully, all of you managed to achieve this uh, target end goal. Um, the Sorry? Explain what it is. Ah. Display. Oh, 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 sorry, sorry. This is the wind, not yet. So, do I cover GitHub and Heroku also? Uh, they need to type commands. I don't know. The, 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 the command is, the, as in the command in my slide, I put a command in the slides. Actually you can, uh, you just copy and paste off. But do they want to go home, it's at 5 o'clock already. Eh? Uh, they want to go home, then they can go home. Uh, I accidentally hi. overshot time. Just a quick poll. So right now you already have a, a very beautiful website. The next step is actually to put it on the internet. So, but it's already 5. We we'll probably take about 15, 15 minutes. Can we do it? A bit longer, 15? maybe 20 minutes, okay, maybe 25, th half an hour. Okay, maybe maybe yeah. 30 minutes. So how many of you would like, like to, to go challenge home. and put it on the internet? Raise up your hand. Okay, we're going to do it. So it's not, it's not compulsory. Yeah, it's too bad. So, so what's gonna oh, so so let's let's do this. Okay, we're gonna extend this by half an hour to go through how do you how do you how do you push the, the codes onto GitHub and how do you deploy your app onto Heroku? So this is completely optional. If you have something to run off to, go ahead. The session is recorded, so you can always watch the recording. It should oh be God, published by uh, yeah. oh. Monday, Monday night. Okay. So okay, let's do it. The can, challenge. Can, can. Uh, okay, I'm very sorry I overrun the time, but if you can go back to the slides, right? 
uh, you can copy and paste the command one. So just keep keep pressing the right until you reach like deploying our website, right? Uh, uh, this is the explanation. Skip, 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 skip. Uh, get to the fifth panel. So this is this is where you uh, the, the stuff in the black boxes is what I uh, want you to copy, but I will go through. Don't worry. Okay, for, for this part, we need to use a terminal. So, uh, let's, I'm going to assume everybody's code is nice and done and completed. So, now we move on to the terminal. So, you need to be, uh, you need to be in the guess the number directory, like how Sunny has been. So, you should see guess the number Sinatra, git colon master. Um, so, if you, what you can do, the concept of git is that, I mentioned earlier it's a, it's a place for you to to store your your project files. So there is think of it as there are files that are in your workspace, and then there is uh, the then the files that are stored on GitHub, and then there's this intermediary location known as a staging location that um, physically probably the physically. It, doesn't it, it, it actually just on your it's your local machine but it's a state it's a state it's a it's like a transition place for your code so what you need to do is you can all type git at dot then press enter how do you open a new tab that oh, oh 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 to open a new tab right you press this click this plus button. Uh, and then now, now you just have to listen to me talk because um, my, 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 my files are a bit different because I already prepared uh, so my files are actually already committed one so what you need to do is if you if you uh, you type git status the repo didn't have a git and no file the repo don't have git and no file right Oh, it's not you write one. It was Gabe write one, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, what that command did is that it added all the files that we uh, it added all the, 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 the files that we work on into this area called a staging area. So, I, I, what I typed in my browser just now, I typed something called git status. What it does is it shows it shows all the. It, it will show. It will identify that we modified these five files. Because this is the five files that we touched in for today. Uh, all these other files, this bundle, these bundle files, right? You are. Um, they are back end related files. Just just pretend that they don't exist. So what we need to. What I need you all to do is. And uh, this part. Uh, try not to be confused, but.
Can you navigate to the, the file browser section, right? Under guess the number Sinatra, you all right click. Right click and then click on new file. So then there's going to be a input box that shows up, right? You all type in dot G-I-T-I-G-N-O-R-E. Git ignore. Oh my god, my spelling sucks. Git ignore. Then press enter. Okay, where's my phone? Hey, Nitrous cannot show hidden system files. So I cannot get all the bundle. No, because the bundle, the bundle is gonna, the bundle is gonna come here. It doesn't matter. Okay, after, after discussion with my friend, uh, let's skip this part. Ignore everything that I just said. So just now, you all type git add full stop already, right? Okay, one, after you all, after you all type git, git dash full stop, what we did is that we put all our files into this staging section. So the next part is we want to push all these files from this staging section into your, the GitHub account that you all created. So what we need to do is that we need to commit, we need to write a commit message. What is a commit message? Is um, every time we make a commit, we want, we want to sort of be able to identify this commit. So a commit message is like a label. I label that this is what I did to the files. So for example, the commit message for this particular commit that we're going to be doing is called add styling to guess the number app. Because in future, if you modify the app again, and then you commit again, you probably want to give it a, a description, like maybe um, minor fix, change title color to blue, or, or something like that. So it sort of identifies. Because the, the how Git works is that you can actually step forward and step back. Because each commit is a snapshot of how your project was at that particular time when you made the commit. So for example, after I made some changes, then I committed, I was, oh no, 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 the first version was my favorite version. You can actually revert back to that version. But if you, if you don't name your commit, if you don't label your commit messages correctly, for example, I have worked in projects where I've seen a consecutive six messages that say, fix, 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 fix. And I didn't know like which, which commit did what. It was a bit irritating. So it's not so much, I know that you're maybe doing this for yourselves, but future you will score present you if you don't label it properly. So let's not do that. So let's just write sensible commit messages. So if you can uh, copy and paste or you want to type the whole thing, is git commit dash small letter m and whatever message you want inside uh, double quotes. So you can you can copy this verbatim, git commit dash m, then add styling to guess the number app. And then just press enter. So you should see something like this, uh, create mode, blah 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 blah. So now that it's committed, you need to push the files to the... So you, you think of it as like your files are trying to cross the custom. Um, when you commit, right, it's just like, it's at the custom and then you drop passport already. So now you need to go across, across to Malaysia, go home. So the last command that you need to do is git push origin master. So it just means you know push your files to the master branch that is upstairs. So if you if you are there, just type the four words git push origin master enter. So right now what this this would have done is this would have committed the files that you all worked on today to your GitHub uh, repository. So if you uh, go to GitHub and you navigate, you you should be able to see something has changed on your own side. So move in. So you should be able to see your commit message on your GitHub, on your GitHub repo page, right? You should be able to see whatever you type in as the GitHub repo. So for example, in my in my own project, 
I actually committed multiple times. So I have like different commit messages. So if all went well and you, you go to your GitHub repository, you should be able to see this. So if you're interested and you can click on commits to see that oh this is what all the commits that happen on your project. Yeah. So in the GitHub part, there's also a Heroku part. Yeah. I'm going to hold on the Heroku part. change like one file right you can just specify or just get a commit the change to this particular file or maybe sometimes a, a, re a real world use case is that because your project got many files and then maybe um, I edit one file but I have work in progress in other files so those uh, work in progress I don't want to commit yet I only want to commit the one co computer one and then I can just specify that file next
Oh, you know, so I know the people fall asleep. So I like, okay, never mind, it's karma. See, it's karma. I know somebody fell asleep. Uh, gymnast, gymnast fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, that's why, like, this one. Okay. Uh, how many people actually followed the on Hiroku section in the in the uh, in the instructions, which is. How many people actually followed the instructions here already? Okay, most of you, right? So if most of you followed the instructions here, when you when you uh you all have Hiroko open, if not just uh, go there. So on your dashboard, right, you should already have an app. Uh So if you if you go to the app go to deploy, so it's like the third option. So ideally you all would have selected uh, the deployment method to be GitHub. So there should be a GitHub connected with a green tick and um, and it, it should it should be connected to your GitHub repository. So if this is not the case, uh, you all ask the assistant coach to come and like help, help here, help there. So then, uh, okay, automatically. Go to the last part which says manual deploy. So you see, deploy your GitHub branch, right? So you just, sell, you all should only have one branch. Uh, I got a lot of branches because I was playing around the other day. You all should just be master. So just select master already, then click on deploy branch. So you should see uh, something pop up and then there will be things running. Uh, so ideally, if all is well, there should be a button that says uh, open app or launch app or view app or something, something, something app. So just click the button and if all is well, you should see what you build. If all is not well, uh, let me know. So um, the URL that that because uh, Heroku is free, right? So uh, there are certain limitations. One of which is that all your URLs will have Heroku app behind them. But because they are offering this service for free, let's not complain and just appreciate the freeness. So um, if all is well, this website that this app that you have just built is live. So this link uh, you can use your phone to access. It should work because it's live on the internet. All of you, so there's probably 60, like 50 copies of the exact same app on the internet right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, potentially different fonts, potentially different background image. So, so just one more thing I want to share is that whatever I covered today is uh, pretty basic. So it's some basic CSS and some basic HTML that, that you can use to make a plain website look pretty. But uh, CSS actually can do a lot more things. So there's this, the, version, the same version of the app that I worked on before this is, um, because with CSS, I can do things like I can make the background change color. Um, I can make the button. So I, I can make the button, I can skew the text, I can make like, the text like sang it. Um, there, you know, there are a lot of things that we can do with CSS. Like the but we can actually style the button to actually behave like a button. So when you press the button, it will be depressed, that kind of thing. So all this can be done with CSS also. So yeah, so hopefully um, me or you are interested can continue on and, and find out more and uh, yeah, I hope today was beneficial to everybody. Yeah. Oh, got announcement, got announcement. Okay, 
so we have come to the real end of the workshop. Uh, feel free to, st to stay just to figure out the kinks with uh, GitHub and also Heroku. We have the space to actually as late as we want. So, but not too late. Um, so the applications for the bootcamp will open tomorrow, tonight or tomorrow, and will last all the way to 2nd of September. And uh, some housekeeping things, like if you have trash, please throw them outside, not in the trash bin, inside the room. And like, yeah, so what now we're going to do is we're going to take a group photo, so everybody stand up. How do you know what you're doing?